No, what I, what I, uh, in the, with the beer, yes. Um, so what I will say, though, is that most people that are here have some level, I'd say most, have some level of appreciation of the process. Yeah. And they don't like sort of last minute modification. Like if there's a good reason for it, they'll tolerate it. But you know, in most situations, there's not a lot of sympathy for you know, last minute disruption.
So we're trying to get started, everybody. In order to get started, we need people to take their seats. And I still need a few counters. So I think I have this side taken care of. I have the back of the middle taken care of. I need um, one more counter up here in the, the front middle section. And I need two counters on um, this side. I guess it is um, stage right. I need two counters over here. Um, any takers? Oh, thank you. Okay, we're all set with counters. I do have, um, hi. Okay. And I have one more request. We have, I think, four people that are in the cafeteria that are checking people in, and those people are also registered voters. And we have two or three people in the cable TV room that are voters, and we want to make sure all of those votes are counted. So I am looking for one person who will take the count and go on the counts where we're asking people, uh, actually, they'll go for all of them. Um, is there anyone who's maybe sitting in the back that will take the, the counter to do that? Thank you.
Megan. We can see each other. We're eager to get started, and we know there are quite a few people still outside registering to come in. So I might encourage folks to move in a little so it's easy for the people who come in after you do to find a seat. Sarah, are you ready? Okay. Okay, folks, it's great to see so many people here tonight. We're going to ask people to continue finding and taking your seats. I do want to just make a few notes for people who maybe haven't been here before. There are a couple of different sections in the, in the hall tonight. Staff and other folks who may have... Um, articles or things that they may be talking about can sit right up here. There's um, a yellow sign that says staff. I think the very front is reserved for media. The very front row there is for media. And in the back is reserved for guests who are not um, registered voters. So if you don't, if you have this card, you should be sitting in one of the seats I didn't point to. So if, if you have this card, please do not sit either in the staff section or in the, the um, visitor section. We will not be counting. Yeah, we will not be counting uh, um, people who are in any of those sections. So to be sure you're counted, please sit in one of the other sections. So I'd like to call the town meeting for 2023 for the town of Hopkinton to order. I'd like to invite the Boy Scout Troop 11 to salute the flag with the color guard and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Color guard, attention. Audience, please rise. Color guard, advance.
Clerk Guard post the flag of the United States of America. Color Guard post the flag of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Please remove any head covers and join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Two. Color Guard, honor your colors. Color Guard dismissed. Thank you. Well, good evening, everybody. As you're continuing to take your seats, I'll give a little bit of background and information about town meeting. I know many of you have been here, and I'm pleased to see some maybe new faces as well. This is a really important part of how Hopkinton is run, right? This is basically the Hopkinton legislature for tonight and maybe another night or two. I did want to take a moment of silence for those townspeople and staff who may have passed since our, our last town meeting. I'm happy to see some young voters here tonight. They can kind of learn how it all works. As you came in tonight, into the field house, you may have picked up a packet. We will refer to that packet throughout the meeting. Our quorum, which I'm very happy to say we know we reached, is 1% of registered voters. So for this, and I believe the next three years, we need 128 people to vote um, on, e on each of the articles. Our first order of business is to appoint a deputy town moderator. This role, actually, sorry, I need to appoint two deputy town moderators. Um, I've asked Connor to be a deputy who's up here with me in case I need to step away for a minute. So I'd like to appoint Connor as a deputy town moderator. And I realized that I had not appointed a second person Lisa Whittemore, would you be willing to do that? Thank you. So I will have Connor, who will help me up here, and then Lisa, if you don't mind wait, uh, waving your hand, Lisa. So Lisa will be responsible for um, helping counters if there are any questions. So this is my first order of business. So I'd like to appoint both Lisa and Connor at one time, all up. Let's see, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay, thank you. So there are some rules of the hall. Many of you have been here before and, and maybe know them. We're lucky um, that we've got something, one new thing to share, so I'm gonna highlight that first. As people know, we're trying to make sure town meeting moves along and we allow townspeople two minutes to speak in response to different motions as they come up. And generally, I have been the timer, which isn't always the smoothest. So we're really lucky to have a timer right over here. So you can see it, I can see it, the speakers can see it. We all will know that there are two minutes uh, for, for people to speak. So um, a big thanks to Megan for running the timer and this Again, is our experiment our first time trying it? As a reminder, if you are a visitor, you are welcome here, and you should be sitting in the back in that visitor section. If the visitor section fills up, please 
um, go into the cafeteria and somebody there will help us um, expand the visitor section as needed. Please stay seated this evening unless you are st um, stepping out for a break or approaching the mic to speak. I will not be taking any formal breaks this evening, so you can build them into your, to your schedule. If we come to standing vote counts, which I'm sure we will, we may close the doors to allow the counters just to keep track of who they've counted and who they've not counted. So if you know there's about to be a vote, you, you may choose to put your break off. Water is allowed here. Other food and drinks are not allowed in the, in the hall, only water. Please turn off or mute your devices. We've got so much tech going on in here tonight. Um, let's, let's not mess up everybody's Wi-Fi. The way the meeting will flow is that I will introduce the article, then I will invite the sponsor to make a motion. Then I will ask the board chairs to share their committee recommendations. The article sponsor may then make a presentation. So we have presentations for a number of the articles. For major presentations, I've asked speakers to stay at eight minutes. Let's, Norman is gonna be keeping me honest on that one, right? Um, smaller presentations and citizens petition, I have asked to limit to five minutes. After those, um, each of the presentations is finished, that is when people can approach the mic. The way it works is that you approach the mic, you will introduce yourself please with your name and your address, and then it's really helpful if you get to your point right at the beginning. So you might say I rise in favor of this, or I rise in opposition. We do take turns back and forth, and all of the discussion happens through me, the moderator. So you will direct comments and questions. So if a person has given a presentation and you have a question, you approach the mic and you say, through you, Madam Moderator, to me, you say your question, and then either the person who was presenting or someone that they designate may answer. So that is how we sort of maintain the flow of the meeting. It is not a debate. Um, please return to your seat at the conclusion of your two minutes. So this is what Megan will be timing. You may approach the mic again if everyone else has had an opportunity to speak. And something I learned from the previous moderator is often the best argument is the most concise one. If you have an amendment to propose, you should first of all let somebody up here know, um, and then you would go to, I think, should they go to the, okay, so yes. You'll go to IT in the back. Could um, one of you raise your hand? Okay, there we go. So if you have an amendment, you would take it to Josh in the back, um, and then you would come to the mic to propose it. I'd like to take one moment to remind all of us that we are neighbors before, and we will be neighbors again after town meeting. Let's work to maintain civility keep our minds open. Contrary opinions can strengthen our discourse. This kind of debate will really enrich us. In discussion will result in the best course of action for Hopkinton. I, I'd also like to just take a moment to say, I know that there are things going on outside of this hall that affect folks in this town and it's, it's certainly um, a difficult time. We can, we can trust that the right um, authorities are, are dealing with that, and let's 
turn our focus this evening to the work we have in front of us. I now call on town clerk Connor Deegan for the call and return of the warrant. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Greetings to the constables of the town of Hopkinton in the name of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. You are hereby required to notify and warn all inhabitants of the town of Hopkinton, qualified to vote in elections and in town affairs of the annual town meeting warrant this day, Monday, May 1st, 2023. Hereof and fail not and make due return of this warrant with your doings thereon to the clerk of said town of Hopkinton at the time and place aforesaid, given under our hands this first day of May, 2023. Thank you. I now call on the chair of the select board, Amy Ritterbush, on customary measures relating to the time of this meeting. Uh, I make a motion that we just at 11 p.m. We, we finish discussion on the issue at hand and then we adjourn to the following evening at 7 p.m. at the same location. Okay. Is there a second? second. All in favor? All opposed? Okay, so that passes unanimously. We will wrap up as close to 11 as, as the timing allows. With regard to the ordering of the articles, now is the one time during the meeting where we will entertain a request to rearrange. Does anyone have a request to change order? Norman, can I make the request? <laughs> yeah. Okay. 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 So we are looking this evening to um, move the DPW related articles to the front of the town meeting to allow us to have the um, expert uh, presentation and information from John Westerling from the DPW. So if somebody would make a motion that we could pull these, sorry, the article numbers are 20, 21, 41, 42, 43, 44, and 45. So we would move, um, I'm looking for someone to make a motion to um, move those to the beginning of the meeting. Motion. Okay, someone second the motion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, so we are gonna um, put these articles at the beginning. We also have a motion for a consent agenda, which, one, just one sec. Okay. Um, Amy or a member of the select board, do you have a motion about the consent agenda? I move that the town take action by unanimous consent on the articles listed on the consent agenda as proposed in the consent agenda handout. They are article number two, um, FY23 supplemental appropriations and transfers. Uh, article three, unpaid bills from previous fiscal year's action. Article eight, chapter 90 highway funds action. Article nine, transfer of other post-employment benefits liability trust fund action. Article. 10, transfer to the General Stabilization Fund, action. Article 11, transfer to the School Special Education Reserve Fund, action. Article 24, Community Preservation Recommendations, motion three, no action. 
Article 30, housekeeping, delete definition, action. Article 37, accept a gift of land, Turkey Ridge subdivision, action. Um, Amy, hold yep. on one second. I did hear a hold call. Um. Okay, so hold call on Article 30? Okay, Article 39, Fruit Street lease, no action. Okay, so um, just because this is probably new for a lot of people, as we're reading out the, the articles that are being proposed to be on the consent agenda, if a person says hold, that means that that article will not be part of the consent agenda and we will consider it in the order in the, in the order it is um, in the warrant. Okay, so just want to make sure everyone understands. So um, the select board move that we do the consent agenda, these um, would be the items 2, 3, 8, 9, 10, 11, 24, motion 3, and then 39, no action. So, um, do I get a second? Do I do a talk? Okay. It's a motion. So, um, I'd like to get a second to this motion and then we can recognize the speaker. Okay. Um, yes. Ann Matina, Ann Matina, 40 Eastview Just Road. one second, Ann. I don't think, um, it's not up. will you tap it? I, I didn't. No, it's not up. There we go. There you go. Um, Ann Matina, 40 Eastview Road, uh, Madam Moderator. I just um, had a question. I didn't know when you were supposed to say the word hold, <laughs> when, <laughs> okay. the, uh, when the uh, items were being read, mm -hmm. um, and I was, going to say hold on Article 24, um, number three. And it's a question on the handout. It says if you have a question rather than a debate point to let you know that. So I don't know when, when I'm supposed to do that part. OK. Well, thank you for asking. And let's, let me just confer here. Okay. And were you saying you had a question or you wanted to say hold? Hold. And then it says on the handout, the procedures, that you will inquire whether my request is for a question, question or, or a debate. debate. And yours is for a question, a question that you didn't get to ask. OK, you, you can proceed with your question. OK, my question is, will, uh, at what point will town meeting see the numbers here? And the second part of that question is, Will we ever get a chance to vote on it, or is, are we just saying we're t accepting it as is? All right, so you're talking about this specific article in 24. So what happens with the consent agenda um, is we, we had a motion to accept a consent agenda. Mm -hmm. If people approve having a consent agenda, we will not, sorry, sorry approve the consent agenda, then we don't, we do not talk. So because yeah. I didn't say hold, you can't answer my question. Is that correct? Um, no, sorry, go, no, we can, we can answer your question. That's what I'm saying. We Thank can answer your question. And your question was, will you see the numbers? Ever? I mean, is that? Well, I mean, um, you can see what's in the in the warrant. One second, Norm. Through, through the moderator, do you want me to yeah. provide more information? Here. Thank you. Me? Shall I provide more information? It's it's only on motion three of the right. Community Preservation Act. So those are items C, F, G, and O that we would do no action tonight. Okay. Thank you. Okay. That. that okay. Good. So I did want to make sure everyone was all right. So we have um, put forth the consent agenda. And then we'll vote on the consent agenda. Okay, so now we're going to vote on the consent agenda. All in favor, please say aye. aye. All opposed. Okay. okay. There was a majority, so the consent. 
consent agenda passes. So now we will move on, as we talked about, to the DPW articles, starting with number 20. Okay. Um, Mike, are you going to make the motion? I'm sorry. I am jumping around. We're at 20. Article 20, roadway paving, Pratt Way, and cemeteries. We move the motion as printed in the Warren Articles and Motions document. Select Board recommends approval. Appropriation. Appropriation Committee recommends approval. Is there someone here from CIC tonight? CIC recommends approval. Okay, do you mind putting it up? I just want to make sure. CIC recommends approval. Okay. Okay, this article provides $480,000 to support paving projects for Pratt Way, which serves the Fruit Street Athletic Fields, and for the internal roadways in Evergreen Cemetery and Mount Auburn Cemetery. This amount is in addition to the general paving program, which was funded with $500. $1,000 in the operating budget in Article 5 and $638,000 provided by the state in Article 8. This additional paving would be funded through general obligation borrowing, also requiring a citizen vote, allowing principal and interest to be excluded from the taxation limits imposed by Proposition 2.5. Okay. So is there any discussion about Article 20? Okay, seeing that there is none, oh, whoop, sorry. It takes, me oh. a minute, it takes me a minute to get out of the seat. Okay, so since you're there, you're the first one we're gonna try this two minutes on, so. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. There we go. Uh, Stephen Popkiss, 24 Cedar Street Extension. Uh, do we have a rationale why these are going to be uh, excluded or instead of just being paid for through some other mechanism? I mean, we have six of them that are going on to questions. So it'd be nice to have some rep representation of why we are choosing this methodology. Okay, that, good question. Um, is that something that you would answer, Norman, or Mike, or Tim, or? Good evening, so the Amount available within the levy to operate the government departments is very limited by Proposition 2.5. That's even heightened more during high inflationary periods when inflation dramatically exceeds Proposition 2.5 limits of 2.5% tax growth. Really, the only way we can fund substantial capital projects is by putting them before town meeting as excluded debt. And you'll see that as a common thread now and most likely in future years, that if it's a borrowing, it will be coming forward as a proposal for excluded debt. And that means the authorization for taxes applies only during the life of the project for that specific borrowing. And then when that project is paid for, that borrowing tapers off and is no longer in the tax bills. Thank you. Uh, yes, ma'am. Mike Shepard, 11 Hill Street. I, I would hope that Pratt Way, as you know, is how everybody accesses the beautiful fields we have. And I have four grandchildren that play there all through the week. I have some evening nights. I'm there all the time. As bad a shape as Pratt Way is now, people drive way too fast. So I'm hoping that when we pave it, and people generally drive faster then, we consider putting speed bumps or signage or something to keep the people from out of town that have never been here before from hitting one of our kids. 
So that's all. I'm, I'm happy it's going to get repaved. It's in really tough shape, but we should seriously consider uh, some way of slowing people down because they're just going to go faster. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else have a comment? Okay. Seeing that there are none, we will vote. I will mention to you, because this is um, a, a voting for expenditures, we need a two-thirds majority. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? That passes unanimously. Okay, on to Article 21. I think this is you again, Mike. Yes. Article 21, Water Department Vehicle Replacement. We move the motion as written to warrant articles and motions document. Select Board recommends approval. Appropriation Committee recommends approval. CIC recommends approval. So this article provides $285,000 to replace a heavy-duty truck for water enterprise work. The vehicle also supports snow clearing operations. Funding will come from the Water Enterprise Fund retained earnings. Okay. I think we need um, a second to that motion. The, sorry, I don't need one. Um, does anyone have any comments or questions about Article 21? Seeing that there are none, for this one we need a simple majority. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? That was a simple majority, so it passes. Um, yes, and that is, a, um, oh, I'm sorry. So we have it at the microphone when um, town residents speak. Are you asking for it to also be? Any of your okay. Um, it's not clear on the closed who is speaking. Okay. Um, yep, yes. Okay. Okay, yes, we, we can do that, I think. Um, does that mean when you're sh seeing, for instance, Mike, is his name tag not visible? Okay, yes, thank you. Moving on to Article 41. I believe this is a motion from the select board. The select board uh, moves the article as written in the motions document. The select board recommends approval. And this is Amy Redderbush. Okay. Um, capital improvements. Mark Logan. Mark Logan, CIC, recommends approval. Thank you. Mike Manning, Appropriation Committee, recommends approval. All right. Is there any discussion about Article 41? I see some people coming down the aisle. Are you folks coming to speak or coming to find a seat? Find a seat. Find a seat, okay, thank you. Does anyone have any questions or comments on Article 41? Okay, seeing that there are none, we need a simple majority vote. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? 
This article passes as a simple majority. Okay, we're on to Article 42, a motion from the Select Board. Uh, select board, or, Amy Ritterbush, the Select Board um, moves the motion as written in the motions document. The Select Board recommends approval. Mark Logan, CIC, recommends approval. Mike Manning, Appropriation Committee, recommends approval. Does anyone have any questions or comments about Article 42? Okay. Again, we need a simple majority. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay, Article 42 passes. Article 43. This is Muriel Kramer. The select board moves the motion as printed in the warrants document, warrants and motions document. And we recommend approval. Okay. Is there a presentation? Does anyone have any questions? I see this is a little bit of a longer article. Does anyone have any questions about it? Okay, seeing that there are no questions, the vote needed for this article is a simple majority. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? So we have a simple majority. Article 43 passes. Article 44, again, motion from the select board. This is Muriel Kramer. We, the select board moves the article as written in the motions, warrant and motions document. Mark Logan, CIC, recommends approval. Appropriation Committee, Mike Manning, recommends approval. This is Muriel Kramer again saying the select board recommends approval. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, seeing that there are no questions, we'll move to a vote. Sorry, if you have a question, yes, please approach the mic. So my name is Catherine Sweeney. I own this property. And I have not been made aware of anything to acquire, gift, purchase, or take by eminent domain. Although we gave permission for them to use the property, to repair the dam. Um, so is that? So I move that it question? be postponed until they actually work with us and ask about the property. OK. Um, so I think I'd like to ask Mr. Westerling to address what it is a question, sort of. Through you, Madam Moderator. First, thank you to town meeting for taking these articles out of order. I appreciate that. Tonight was the only night that I was available, so I appreciate that to be here to be able to answer questions. Um, through you, Madam Moderator, we had discussions with uh, Mr. and Mrs. Sweeney about an easement on the property to be able to accomplish this work, and that's actually what this allows us to do to uh, take a, a, an easement to be able to accomplish this work. I move that it be modified to include that, that it's included as an easement and not that it is gift purchase or an eminent domain. Um, okay, so um, just one, one second, let me make sure. Um, 
So um, let me ask town council to just weigh in on, on what you just asked for, okay? Um, Brian, can you also introduce yourself, please? Yes, uh, Brian Bertram uh, from town council's office. Uh, good evening. So the motion itself is just by gift, and this is just a town meeting authorization to do it, but we'd still have to work with you to actually enter into an easement agreement. So just by town meeting voting tonight would not actually complete the easement. Town staff would still have to work for you on the terms of that. So what are my rights if this passes? Um, so you, you're asking through me and I'll ask, I'll I'm ask sorry, Brian. It's okay. Uh, your rights haven't changed. All we are do all town meeting is doing, is we have to do by statute whenever we acquire an interest by land as the town, is to get an authorization from town meeting to negotiate the terms with you. So town staff still would have to negotiate the terms of the, the gift agreement or the terms of the easement. We can't come onto your property until you agree to that. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions or comments about Article 44? The vote required for this is a simple majority. All in favor, please say aye. aye. All opposed? Okay, we're gonna do a count of this. What that means is that, um, first of all, Everybody should please come in and take a seat. We do not count people who are standing in the back of the room. So you need to be in a seat to be counted. We'll start with, we'll start with the yeses. What you'll do is you'll stand up please and hold your, your card and then the counters will count you. We will, announce as we get the counts so please do not sit down until we have announced that we that we have the the numbers so right now we're having people stand up and hold your card up if you are voting yes on article 40 44 and to the, to the counters, we will count to everybody in this front area. I counted the front at 11, you may be seated. Madam Moderate. Hi. Hi. S 69 on your right. Okay. Okay, so the folks on this side may be seated.
um, through the moderator. Center front. Um, it, sorry. Center front and middle, 61. Thank you. Oh. Stage left, 108. Thank you. Yes, you may be seated. So it looks like we have one group that we're, we're still counting. Oh, two groups. Center back, 58. Thank you. So we do have a counter who's counting people in the cafeteria and in the um, <laughs> TV booth. Yes, TV and registration, six yes. Okay. So we are also going to count the, the nays. If you vote nay, please stand up and you will be counted now. So please stand up. Um, yes. Center back, 11. Thank you. Center back, you may be seated. Yes. On your right, 22. Okay. Stage left, 3. Yes. Center middle, um, 31. Okay. I know there were no, no one in the TV area. Um, it has come to my attention that there may be some overflow. Um, there's, some, there's some people who've set up sort of an overflow area. Um, I think right now anyone who voted and is in this area, if you could stay in here while we try to figure out um, the... Where, who's in overflow? So, um, where are they? Okay. Are they, in there? Are they in there? okay, so we understand there are some people in the gym. After this vote, we will ask them all to move in here. But right now, we're going to ask um, Lisa Whittemore, um, John in the orange sweatshirt, and um, I need one more counter to, to join Lisa and go into the, um, the gym and do a count in there. And then we will have all those people move into here. Okay, I, I see someone raising their hand. All right, we've got, thank you. We've got three people. So we're going to have those people counted. And then we'll take a moment and get everybody to move into here.
13 yes, zero no's. Thank you. Mm. So we are asking folks who had set up in, in the gym to make their way into this hall. We still have some seats available. So if people can um, make room, we will have everybody seated here. We are set up if we truly overflow, and we will be able to manage in, in the gym if, if we truly overflow. So this passes 336 to 77. So just to come back to Article 44. Yes, sir. Madam, moder Madam Moderator. Sorry. Can Madam someone turn the mic on here? That would be really good, yes. Sir, can you please introduce yourself? Because we're not in the middle of an article right yeah, now. Yeah, understand. Madam Moderator, Martin Bays, 106 Hayden Row. Could I ask through you a question for clarification? In the case of an article where we have the wording of the motion and then a summary above it where the wording does not match, could you uh, advise me whether we should be voting simply on the wording of the motion or should we take into account also the introductory wording, which may have been the confusion in the previous article? I'm going to turn this to Brian. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, Brian Bertram, Town Council's office again. So there's, as you observe, there's two sections in the Warren and Motions document. The top section is the article that Warren Town Meeting um, in the Warren about the subject matter. Uh, typically, because we're preparing for Town Meeting, we draft that more broadly than the motion because we cannot vote on anything that's outside the scope of that article. But all town meeting is actually asked to act upon tonight is the text of the motion itself, which oftentimes, and in this case, is more narrow than the article because we've now decided the specific mechanism we want to use. So uh, with this article as an example, you know, we could have acquired by purchase, we could have exercised eminent domain, or we could have acquired by gift. Uh, it was ultimately determined that we would proceed by gift, and so the motion specifies only that course of action. So just to summarize, even though the article's reprinted in the document that you have, it's only the text of the motion that you are actually voting on. Thank you, sir. Okay. I think we've got everybody. We are now on Article 45. This is Muriel Kramer. Uh, uh, we move that the town vote to authorize the select board to acquire a temporary easement of 2,800 and, oh my gosh, 83 square feet on a piece of land by eminent domain as shown on Lake Maspinock Dam left downstream wall repair, prepared by Pear Corporation and dated September 2022, a copy of which is available for inspection at the office of the town clerk said land being a portion of property shown on assessor's map 10, lot four, rear north pond ter road terrace, um, heirs of William H. Casey, plan book 2667, page 557, and said easement to be used for future dam repairs for the Lake Maspinock Dam. The select board recommends approval. Thank you. Mark Logan, CIC, recommends approval. Mike Manning from Appropriation Committee recommends approval. Okay, are there any questions or comments about Article 45? John Ritz, 11 Erica Drive. Um, going back to what we were saying that it's the Wording in the motion, this says acquire by gift, and then it says by eminent domain. Yeah. Um, 
Let me recognize town council to speak to that. Brian Bertram, town council again. Um, there was a, a misprint in the motions document. So when the chair of the select board just read the motion, it was, or excuse me, not chair, um, but when one of the members of the select board just read the motion, it was um, just by gift. It was not by eminent domain. So that's the motion we're acting on. Okay, so we're, we're acting on a motion that is by gift. So Oh, I think, um, yeah, there we go. So actually, the gift should be there, right? The, the gift just had the line made through it. I think you would. Um, what was this? Oh. Um, OK. So this, um, it turns out this one is a little bit um, Okay, sorry, we're gonna have Brian try to explain this one. <laughs> sorry. Sorry, I, I flipped my two. So this one is by eminent domain. Um, so the, this one is by eminent domain because the owner of this parcel is unknown. The parcel in Milford right now is actually in tax title status. Um, and so the only expedient way we can go about this uh, is by taking the parcel by eminent domain. Otherwise we have to wait for a period that probably would extend well past a year or more to have that tax title process conclude. Um, and so uh, to correct my own uh, misstatement before, and I apologize for that, we are striking by gift because this one should be by eminent domain, again, because we cannot identify the owner of the parcel. Okay, so the motion before us is about acquiring by eminent domain this parcel. I'm sorry, but it's a temporary easement. Mm -hmm. So we are eminent dom okay. So we're taking a temporary easement by eminent domain. So that is a motion in front of us. We need a simple majority. All in favor, please say aye. All opposed? The simple majority passes. Okay, so we have now gotten through the DPW articles that we took out of order. Um, as Mr. Westerling um, pointed out, he wanted to be able to be here for them and, um, and we've completed them. So thank you to everybody and thank you um, to John too. So now we will go to the beginning, starting with Article 1, which is the acceptance of town reports. Okay. Amy Ritterbush, we move that the town accept the reports of the town officers, boards, and committees. Select board recommends approval. Okay. Does anybody second the motion? Second. Thank you. Is there any board or committee who would like to give a report to this body? Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Dan McIntyre. I'm chair of the Permanent Building Committee, and I'm here tonight to give you an update on the status of the center school. Uh, I'm happy to report tonight that the Permanent Building Committee has determined that the center school site uh, can be developed to meet all of the needs identified by the center school reuse committee. We have approximately 11 acres at that site that can be used to meet all of those needs. Uh, parks and rec facilities, new space for youth and family services, and new offices to ease town hall overcrowding, to name just a few. And although the site is adequate, 
The buildings are another story. Uh, Center School was developed in three phases, starting in 1928, with an addition in the 1950s, and then a third addition in the 1980s. Uh, we came to the same conclusion as the school committee. Uh, those building structures are just not conducive to creating adequate floor space for the needs that we have currently. Although the buildings don't meet that needs, there are other considerations we have to uh, address as well. Uh, and at Center School, an important one is the historical significance of the 1928 section. We did meet with the Historic Commission, and they confirmed their desire that that 1928 section should be saved. Uh, not only for its iconic looks, but also its location, how it overlooks Town Common. So what the Permanent Building Committee would propose is an adaptive reuse of the 1928 section, and then new construction out back tailored to meet our needs. Another consideration is cost. Uh, what I just briefly described is expensive. So we asked ourselves another question. Can any part of that center school property be used to help reduce the costs uh, by potentially selling part of it to a private developer and use that funds to offset the project costs? Uh, the answer to that question was yes. Uh, many private developers, both local and out of town, have expressed interest. Uh, primarily for housing, generally high density housing such as apartments, uh, but also some co limited commercial space may fit in there as well. There are some major issues with that concept, uh, specifically zoning, uh, but the committee still believes that option is worth pursuing in an effort to ease the burden to taxpayers. And it would also support our downtown revitalization initiative by bringing more people to the downtown within walking distances to our businesses. Or better yet, instead of walking, we could use our new bike lanes. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist that one. Uh. So one other thing we learned during our exercise was that the town needs are ever-changing and growing. Uh, what the Center School Re Reuse Committee identified, uh, while still valid, there are other needs that need to be addressed as well. In addition, Elmwood School soon, soon may be uh, uh, abandoned by the school committee and uh, given to the town to deal with. Wh what are we to do with that building? Do we want to start another Elmwood School Reuse Committee to address that? These, these are questions that we, we need to ask ourselves. So rather than hastily propose a development for Center School, we think the prudent thing to do is take a step back and look at comprehensive planning of all the town needs and also look beyond just the center school site. Look at our other town assets, such as potentially Elmwood School, uh, reuse of the existing town hall, and the available space over at our Fruit Street site. So with the endorsement of the select board, we've proceeded with doing an updated needs analysis. We've already met with many of the town departments. We'll be meeting with others in the coming weeks to, to develop a comprehensive needs assessment. We've also assembled a lot of historic data we have on our sites at Elmwood School, Fruit Street, and Town Hall from previous planning studies that we can use in this existing planning study. So the questions that we're really tasked to address are, what are our D needs? Dan, I, I'd like, uh, may I interrupt you? Um, you're sharing a lot of really good and valuable information, and um, I didn't have a chance before tonight to talk with you about um, time limits. 
could I ask you, could I ask you to wrap, um, wrap up? And, and one of the things that I, I made a note of, if, if a person wants to get involved or understand more, wh where would they head? Is there a website or a section of the town website? How could someone learn more tonight? Or not tonight, maybe tomorrow night or some other time? You, you actually don't really have a no, lot I of do. time? <laughs> no, I gotta have time. You gotta give me another minute. Right. Well, I, I look at this. This might be what you're talking about. It is. I'm going right into that. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> the questions are what are our needs? What facilities do, do we need to build to address those needs? And where they should be located? So as you see up here, and you may see out on the, in the tables out there, uh, the, the Permanent Building Committee has organized a public forum to seek your input. Because without town input, we won't have a successful project. So I encourage you to come out on May 24th uh, to provide us your thoughts on those questions. Uh, if you can't make it on the 24th, we also developed a website where you can provide comments. Uh, but we really encourage you to get involved in this project. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. John, I'm going to have them put five minutes on the clock. Are you good with that? I'll be type five. I got it. Okay. Um, okay, Megan, it's going to put oh, we, five minutes. I mean, it's acceptance of town reports, so okay. I I'm would say checking. are you gonna, you're going to provide a town report, right? And then if someone has a question. Okay. Um, good evening. Uh, my name is John Graziano. I am the chair of the Elementary School Building Committee. Joining me up here is Mike Shepard, who is also a member of the Elementary School Building Committee. Uh, for the past year, we have been working with um, the community to determine a solution for the needs of the Elmwood School, which currently houses our second and third grade students. So um, just to give a quick update on the project, um, and give you some context because obviously this is related to a lot of the items we'll be discussing both in the school budget and capital tonight. Um, throughout 2022, we concurrently looked at locations throughout town that were large enough to suit a potential new school and also worked with both uh, faculty and staff within the schools as well as community members to understand what would be the vision for a new or renovated Elmwood school. After a long and exhaustive analysis process, we determined that the preferred site for the new school would actually be on Hayden Row, adjacent to the property that currently houses the Marathon School. So our current schem uh, proposed schematic design um, exists next to the Marathon School in the plot of land that was formerly known as the, the Todaro property, it's kind of behind uh, start line. Um, and in addition, we, uh, at the direction of the school committee, are looking to build a school that will not only replace Elmwood, but also be able to house the fourth graders of Hopkinton, given the, the increasing enrollment, allowing the district more flexibility to handle that growing enrollment. Um, so this building, again, would be off of Hayden Row and would house our second, third, and fourth grade students. Um, it Can I just interrupt yep. you for one second? Your deck has not been up here, um, so I'd like to take, take a pause. Okay. Um, let's um, get this, this deck. Um, yeah, it's helpful because we got pictures. I, I know. I looked at them, right? So um, if we could get this, um, this deck up here. There we go. Um, go one. OK, so I am going to reset your time. So I don't even need it. You don't even need it? 
Yeah, this is the one I want right here. Okay. Um, okay, so you can see here, as I mentioned, this is, um, you can see where the Marathon School is. We would want to connect these schools for a couple of purposes. One, to just make the system easier because those are all, obviously, those schools would have a lot of collaboration. Um, but as probably many people in the audience are thinking, one of the key questions is traffic. Um, we know that there's already a lot of traffic on Hayden Road during school time. Um, we have taken that into consideration. We set this building, this proposal, pretty far back into the site, specifically so that we could make the driveway longer. The driveway would actually be able to queue up um, close to 100 cars, which would take most of the cars off of Hayden Row during the time that it usually backs up. The connection point would also allow a better flow for Marathon School because, as you know, there's currently only one way in and out of the Marathon School for normal traffic. This would have its own driveway, so you could have cars flowing in one driveway and out the other and buses the same way. So traffic is a major consideration for us, and we will continue to look at it with our traffic engineers. Um, you can see in the design of the school, it has three wings. I mentioned before, it's gonna hold uh, almost 1,200 students. So um, it gives a tremendous amount of flexibility for the school to determine how they wanna set up those neighborhoods, either by grade level or other ways, but really create a comfortable feel in those wings for what will be a fairly large school. Um, at the moment, we are um, current cost projections, which is the other question after traffic that everybody always asks. Um, are estimating somewhere between 160 and 170 million dollars um, all in for this project. Uh, this is driven by a couple of factors. First uh, is inflation. So we all know that inflation has been a factor, but construction, especially around schools, has seen some of the largest inflation in the past few years. Um, if you compare it to the Marathon Project, this is also a school that's going to be about twice the size of the school we built at Marathon. Um, worth noting, one last point on cost, just to, to keep it short. Um, the cost estimates for this, as well as renovating Elmwood or looking at any of the other options we had, all came in relatively even. There are a lot of factors that I could get into and be happy to with, you know, if, if you want to reach out um, for questions, but there was no sort of more or less expensive option. We'll be getting that cost estimate, obviously, in a little bit more detail as we make decisions around what the HVAC and mechanical systems are gonna be, what some of the other details of the building are gonna be over the next few months. Um, over the summer, the committee will be really drilling down into the details of the design of the school, and our plan is to propose a special town meeting sometime in the fall, likely around November, where we would bring the final design of the school for appropriation at town meeting. Um, I should have mentioned, really should have mentioned, when I was talking about the cost that we are partnering and part of the Mass School Building Authority process. And so uh, that 160 to 170 million dollars is before their reimbursement. They will pay a, for about 25 percent of the project all in when all is said and done. Um, so we have a website that is elmwoodproject.com that you can always go to. It's updated regularly with information, including our meeting and public forum schedule. I'd encourage you to attend as many of those as you can um, to get informed. Our email address is also on there. If you have any specific questions, we're, we're happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. So for, for folks who may not have... Um, been in town meeting before. It's sort of funny that we're well into it. To the evening and we're at Article 1. We are <laughs> accepting town reports. So the motion was made to accept the town reports and then we give, we give committees an opportunity to provide an update as, as we've just heard. So now, should there be any questions? I, um, I guess you could ask them. Does anyone have any questions? Okay. So what we're doing now is to vote to accept the reports from, from the committees, two of whom we've just heard from. So we need a simple majority, and we will be accepting those reports. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. 
All opposed? We need a simple majority, and we had that, so um, Article 1 passes. Oh, unanimously, I'm reminded. All right, so now we are moving into the financial section of the meeting, starting with Article 2. Four. We already did two and three. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, Article 4. Okay. The Select Board moves the motion as written in the motions document. The Select Board recommends approval. This is to set the salary of the town clerk. Okay. Appropriations Committee. Uh, Madam Moderator, it is our motion uh, to make um, for this, but. Okay. Um, that's, so that's actually what I have in my packet also, so. Um, so I'll just say we move the motion as written in the warrant articles and motions document. Okay, so I heard a second. Let's see, this one also needs a simple majority. All in favor, please say aye. aye. Wait. Okay. All right. Appro um, Mike, on behalf of the Appropriations Committee, my understanding is that you actually have to make the specific um, recommendation. So for the Appropriation Committee, Mike Manning, we recommend approval of this motion. Okay. Also, if I can explain, you know, Mass General Law uh, requires town meeting to set the salary and compensation of all elected officials who are paid. The only such elected official in Hopkinton is the town clerk. So the proposal sets the town clerk's salary at $81,791.44, an 8% increase above last year's salary level. Okay, so I, I moved too quickly and we are gonna do the vote again. So I'm gonna ask for eyes first. Simple majority is required. All in favor, please say aye. All opposed? Okay, this passes unanimously. Okay. We are now moving to Article 5. Article 5, the fiscal year 2024 operating budget. The Appropriation Committee moves the Motion as written in the Warrant Articles and Motions document. Amy Ritterbush, the Select Board recommends approval. Mike Manning, Appropriation, recommends approval. Okay. And Mike, I think you're up first. Megan, uh, could, oh, we are. Okay. She's Thank you. Good oh. evening, Madam Moderator and citizens of Hopkinton. The Appropriation Committee is pleased to present the fiscal year 2024 budget for your consideration. Article 5 covers general municipal operations, including the schools, town departments, and debt payments on general town projects. It also, it also authorizes the expenditure of user fees that will be raised in the water and sewer enterprises and it would authorize the administrative expenses and debt payments to support the dedicated community preservation fund. New capital articles that will be proposed for funding from existing resources or from new borrowing are covered in later articles. In preparation for today's annual me town meeting, the Appropriation Committee has developed a comprehensive 80-page report covering the budget and financial articles, with a lot of support from town departments as well as boards, committees, and commissions. That report has been posted online and is provided in your packet today. One of the town's core financial principles is to budget in a cautious and prudent way, which means taking a pessimistic view of potential revenue coming in, while also trying to make sure that budgets are able to absorb inflationary cost increases, which are difficult to predict in periods of higher inflation. 
the review process paid close attention to and carefully evaluated the targeted service at level increases that have been included in this budget, which are limited to the Hopton Public Schools. Through a combination of cost containment and some good news on estimated revenues, the proposal before today's town meeting, if approved, will deliver a balanced budget, one that sustains fiscal year 2023 service levels across departments that pays for contractual and other inflationary cost increases, that continues normal capital spending to renew town facilities and equipment, and that provides for targeted increases in the schools to deal with the growing enrollment and a changing student need profile. I mentioned that this budget proposal contains some targeted service level increases. Specifically, the proposed budget provides the Hopkinton Public School with a $4.5 million funding increase, not including a substantial increase in school and town staff benefit costs. The school budget will also include an additional $1.1 million in Article 11 to support tuition for special education students who are placed in programs outside the community. The school department will address this and other increases during the discussion of this article. In other town departments, increases support the sustainment of fiscal year 2023 level services. The tax impact of the proposed budget on existing homeowners will be 2.9%. If all the capital items proposed for general fund support are approved by town meeting, and if approvals are voted at the, ta uh, at the May 15th town election for items involving debt to be excluded from the tax limits of Proposition 2 and a half. That 2.9% would add $345 on, exist on the existing $11,599 tax bill for Hopkinton's average residence, which is now has a value of $753,000. The specific Appropriation Committee departmental line-by-line -line dollar recommendations are in the report on pages 65 through 74, with the specific dollar recommendations in the right-hand column titled Appropriation Committee Recommendation. The operating budget presented today was developed through a very public and very collaborative process, one that involved contributions from dozens of citizen volunteers, collaboration with the town's professional staff, timely distribution of key information to the public, and many opportunities for public comment and involvement, including four dedicated public listening sessions. The budget does a good job of addressing pressing needs within existing constraints, including tax impact. I also want to very briefly discuss the longer-term horizon for the operating budget. Between 2013 and 2023, the valuation of property in Hopkinton rose from $2.8 billion to $5.5 billion, a 96% jump driven by both new construction and steep growth in the value of existing property. Residential property counts for 82% of that amount, very close to the proportion of residential property a decade ago. And while the town has an important commercial and industrial presence, the numbers show that Hopkinton is truly a community of homes and families. Considering the general fund pay-as-you-go capital proposals, enterprise funds, and community preservation, budgeted spending will top $113 million. Current debt levels are well within the town's established policy limits and are well within the state's statutory limit for municipal debt. Anticipated debt is a more challenging issue, which I'll cover shortly. The town is making expected progress on funding long-term liabilities, which has been a long-standing goal. Hopkinton's public employee pension is tracking to be fully funded by 2038, and the other post-employment benefit, or OPEB, liability to public employees retire health, retiree health care is tracking to be fully funded by the mid-2050s. But sooner if funds currently being used to pay down the pension liability are applied to the retiree health care liability once the pension is fully funded. Hopkinton retains the very highest bond rating, Standard & Poor's AAA, which allows the town to borrow for construction and improvement projects at the very lowest possible financing cost. In addition to that very positive news, the town does face several noteworthy long-term financial challenges, and I specifically noted these challenges in last year's presentation. First, the town is in the process of studying the construction of an Elmwood school replacement or renewal, and the school department also has a longer-term plan for a major upgrade to the Hopkins School, Middle School, and High School. In other departments, there may be future, borrow future bo borrowing for any eventual center school reuse and for additional water system infrastructure. These projects could have very significant tax impact and water rate impacts. 
I want to be very clear that the items in the five-year capital plan for fiscal years 2025 through 2028 are not fully developed and are not being considered for approval tonight. But they are important to understand for planning purposes. I'll show some graphs covering the debt issue shortly. Second, over the past decade, the town has relied on new revenue from new residential construction, especially at legacy farms, to not only cover the cost of expanded services tied to growth, but to also cover a portion of the inflationary cost increases in town salaries and expenses that are unrelated to growth. If new residential development slows, as is projected in the multi-year budget forecast, inflationary costs for providing ongoing services that are above the 2.5% property tax increase allowed by the state Prop 2.5 law will create future budget shortfalls. With these pressures, it will be important for the town to focus on spending control both within the cost base for existing services and in considering what new service expansions can be undertaken and in considering the timing of major capital projects. The development of spending plans for fiscal year 2025 and beyond will have to balance these competing pressures. The town's elected and appointed leaders are tracking these issues very closely. Next. As I noted early, earlier, property tax makes up the vast majority of the town's revenue for general government activities, including the schools and other town departments. It's noteworthy that the town's commercial and industrial tax base has grown ra as rapidly as the town's residential tax base over the past decade. Local aid from the Commonwealth is the town's next and mo most important source of funds for the fiscal year 2024. And the town benefited from a very strong 14.5% increase in local aid under Governor Healy's first budget. On the expense side, Hopkinton's outstanding public schools are by far the largest slice of the spending picture. In addition to the direct segments shown for education, the majority of amounts of for benefits and insurance and debt payments directly support education. Earlier, I mentioned the town's AAA bond rating. A higher bond rating means lower borrowing costs, which will be increasingly important if the town enters a period of aggressive facility renewal. One of the factors that supports that rating is a healthy level of town financial reserves. Article 10 will propose to add $700,000 to the general stabilization fund to grow that fund as the overall budget grows. The slide on the screen, which, also show, which is also shown on page 29 of the Appropriation Committee report, shows the history of government, general government fund principal and interest payments going back several years and projecting forward but only including projects that will be voted on in this annual town meeting. If all the general government projects proposed at this town meeting were to be approved, basically this chart shows that the current levels of debt are consistent with recent levels. The new projects being proposed are covered in articles 15 through 20. But we're showing this slide here because the principal and interest payments for these projects will eventually be paid from the annual general government budgets. This additional slide shows a farther view into the future and the top line on the chart includes everything already approved, everything that is proposed to be approved at this town meeting, and on the very top line, everything that has been included by departments on the town's preliminary draft capital plan. Again, none of the projects that show the upward spikes on the top line have been finalized. None of them have been approved, and none of them will be voted on tonight. This chart presented here is to provide a sense of what principal interest payments could look like under the current very uncertain estimates. The level of capital expense and associated debt reflected in this chart is unpre unprecedented in Hopkinton. Initial estimates using planning amounts and projecting 3.4% interest rate, the capital plan by itself would add about 30% of the current Hopkinton tax bill in the peak year. With the slowdown in new residential growth and if contractual salary and benefit increases remain high due to inflation, these factors together could lead to a 40 to 50% increases in property tax bills in the coming five years. Again, these amounts are very preliminary and have not been approved, but are presented to show scale of new debt payment expense that the town could be facing in coming years if a very large capital plan is implemented. The right-hand side of the scale shows an estimate of the tax cost for this debt service for the average home with a value of $753,300. Slide 10 shows a comparison of the tax impact of the proposed budget package to inflation for the past 12 months with several years of data shown. The big jump in the darker bar on the chart over the last two years reflects the large jump in energy prices and the impacts that that's had on other goods and services the town buys. Because the town spends a relatively small percentage of its budget on energy costs, 
because the tax revenue from new growth and the property tax base and local aid from the state has continued to be strong, the tax impact has been managed within the tax increase limits of Prop 2.5, which is really positive outcome for fiscal year 2024. If inflation continues at high levels, that will result in additional pressure on the town budget in coming years. Article 5 authorizes spending levels for the water and sewer enterprises where operations are supported completely from user fees charged to customers. Water and sewer fees for the coming year will be set by the select board next month, but I included this slide showing a large increase in borrowing costs for the water enterprise related to the planned borrowing for a connection to the Mass Water Resources Authority water supply at the Quabbin Reservoir. The graph reflects cost for borrowing for interim PFAS filtration and an expected $25 million cost for MWRA connection. Grant or other available funding could reduce this burden on water system customers, but I'm showing the full impact here for informational purposes. Mike, I got how are you doing? 30 seconds. 30 seconds, okay. I encourage residents and especially water customers to follow the June water enterprise rate hearings carefully. Article 5 also approves administrating administrative spending for the Community Preservation Fund with 83,886 going to staff costs and expenses and authorizes 149,544 to pay principal and interest on debt approved by town meeting 2013 and 2019 for projects included for land acquisitions, improvements at Food Street athletic fields and high school athletic field lighting. Overall, the budget presented today does a very good job of balancing competing priorities. This budget supports the continuation of excellent public services, and it does so while preserving reserve stabilization funds and funding long-term reliabilities. The select board recommends approval, and the appropriation committee recommends approval. I understand the Hopping Public School may have additional comments on the operating budget, and we'll have comments on capital items when these are up for discussion. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to that committee for all the, all the work you've done and the what you've delivered. I think the school committee, no, sorry, <laughs> school administration has got a presentation. Can you, can you introduce yourself for the purposes of uh, um, the, the closed captioning, please? Good evening, everyone. I'm Carol Cavanaugh, the superintendent of the Hopkinton Public Schools, and with me this evening is Mrs. Susan Rothermick, the director of finance and operations. It's our pleasure to present to you tonight the FY24 school budget. So as we always do when we are putting this budget together, we go to our building principals and all of our directors, and we ask them to be very fiscally responsible in putting together the budget. What they're asking for are really what our students need. We also ask them to make sure that we are maintaining our exceptional educational and extracurricular programming. Hopkinton has a, re a reputation for very high performance and we want to make sure that our students have access to that. When we offer curriculum and instruction, we need to make sure that it meets the needs of every one of our learners. And I think tonight, as you look at my presentation, you're going to see that the profiles of our students are becoming more disparate and the enrollment is growing um, leaps and bounds. And I know I tell you that every year when I stand before you. So when we talk about curriculum and instruction, what we're really thinking about is making sure that our kids' academic, behavioral, mental health, special education, social, emotional, and ESOL needs are all being met. We are accommodating enrollment growth and supporting all of our building principles, school improvement plans. So let's start by looking at enrollment numbers and our students changing profiles. The enrollment numbers are expanding and the profiles are becoming uh, more and more disparate. What you see on the screen right now, and I know it may be challenging to see that, but we have had two different demographers work with us to predict and project enrollment growth here in Hopkinton. What you are seeing is a projection based on cohort survival only. If you look at the 23-24 school year, the year for which this budget has been developed, you can see that we have projected 4,160 students, and that would be 
by June of 2024. If you look at the bottom of that slide, you can see that today we are already at 4,209 students. So we are above now where we are projected to be in June of 24. And when we gave this presentation to uh, Josh, uh, we were at 4,209. We're actually at 4,216. So today we're about 54 kids ahead of where we are supposed to be next year. The next slide shows the same projections, but instead of being cohort survival only, what you see here is new housing factored in. And so the projected number has gone from 4,160 to 4,186. It's a small increase for sure. Uh, but we are still ahead even if we look at those numbers with new housing. And I think a more important number for you on this slide is the one at the bottom right, the 4,745 students. That's where our demographer says we will be by the time we get to 2030. If we take a look at where the MSBA, the Massachusetts School Building Authority, says we'll be in the year uh, for uh, 2031, they are projecting about 5,000 students. And so the growth is here. It continues to come. We are tracking ahead. I wish I had different news for you, but our schools, I know that uh, Mr. Manning was just explaining how expensive it is to run the schools. It is because they are expanding. I'd like to talk a little bit about the profiles of our students because those are changing, as I've noted. I think to do this, it's best to look at it from a historical view. On the screen right now, you can see what the high needs students looked like in Hopkinton in the year 2010, 2011. Students who identified as English language learners Less than 1% of your population, 0.8% of the kids here needed ESOL services. Low income, less than 2%, and those were years in which we didn't even qualify for Title I through the federal government. So in 2010, 2011, it was 1.8% of our kids identified as low income. And then if we take a look at um, our students with dis disabilities, that's the third category of high needs, 12.7% of the population were students who needed special education services. Now we can fast forward to the year 2015-2016. Again, those numbers haven't changed markedly. The English language learners have risen from 0.8 to 1.7%. Students with disabilities went from about 12.5 to 13 and our students who were economically disadvantaged, although they were less than 2% in 2010, rose to 3.6%. So the total in 2010, we were at about 15% high needs kids. In 2015, we were at about 17% high needs kids. If you take a look at where we are in the year 2023, that percentage in this community has gone closer to 30%. 30% of our kids, and this is the disparity I'm talking about in terms of their profiles, have some kind of need, whether it's they need to learn the English language, they have special education needs, they have socioeconomic needs. And this may be the reason why our building principals and our directors are saying that they're being asked to do more with less. I think to kind of complete this profile of your schools and where things are, it's important to look at per pupil expenditures and student to teacher ratios. Every year I stand before you and we talk a lot about per pupil expenditures and I say that that's the Commonwealth of Massachusetts way of comparing apples to apples from school district to school district. We always use these towns, or at least we have been for as long as I've been assistant superintendent or superintendent. Why have we chosen them? If you look at Weston, Weston has a more than $30,000 
per pupil expenditure. And we choose these communities because some of them are towns that want to be like us. Some of them are towns that we want to be like. Some of them are towns with whom we share a contiguous border. Some of them are towns where Desi says we have a very similar profile. So we put them all together. And again this year, Hopkinton is ranked 32nd out of those 33. Our per pupil expenditure it's $15,870 per student. The state average is about $19,000 per student. And I don't give you those numbers so that you can think that we're, we're complaining about our per pupil expenditure. That's, that's not what we're doing. I think the illustration here is that the schools and the children that we're educating, there are a lot of demands, and we're making a lot of very good things happen on a very tight budget. As I said on my opening slide, we try to be fiscally responsible. We try to have excellent academic programming, extracurricular program, and I, I think we do all of those things with this budget. So I just want to explain to you what per pupil expenditure is. There are 321 communities across the state, uh, school districts across the state, and you get to see everybody's per pupil expenditure if you go to the DESE website. On this slide, if Hopkinton falls into the bottom 25% of per pupil expenditure, the number is circled in red. If we fall into the bottom 50%, the number is circled in blue. If we are in the top 30%, the number is circled in green. So you can see that we are very low in our per pupil expenditure. What this slide does is it shows you a rank order and it shows you the buckets into which DESE classifies per pupil expenditure. So they look at things like administration. They look at instructional leadership, how we pay our teachers, our special education pupil services, operations and maintenance, what we pay for insurance for our school teachers, uh, and anyone really who works in, in the public schools. And you can see those numbers. So for example, um, when we are talking about the kinds of instructional leadership uh, that support teaching and learning but don't necessarily put themselves in front of students, um, in that situation we are ranked 316th out of 321. So I'm really trying to illustrate um, that we are doing a lot with a little, and I'm proud of the work that we do. I don't want you to think that I'm not proud of it. Finally, I think that people have been hearing we've been adding a lot of teachers, a lot of FTEs to the public schools, and where are all of these people going? I want to illustrate for you that the hiring of all of these people is commensurate with the numbers of students joining our schools. So what you see on the slide now is the student to teacher ratio in 2010. For the Hopkinton Public Schools, we had 14.6 students to every one educator. If we look at the next slide, in 2015, 2016, we had 13.6 students to every one educator. And then if we forward to 21, 22, the most recent year in which data is available to us, we have 14 students to every one teacher. And you can see that the state average on that slide is about 12 kids to every one teacher. So it's not as if our, our student to teacher ratio is extraordinarily great, it's, it's pretty, it's okay. Uh, but what you're seeing there is that the, the difference between the 13.6 and the 14.6, what appears to be our high and our low, is fairly negligible. So when we are adding all of those faculty members to our schools, we're asking for those people, not because we are padding the schools with additional adults, but because they are there to service the children who are already here. Um, I know that we continue to talk about the needs for space. If we are moving to 5,000 students by the year 2031, we need all the space that we are describing. I know this is an FY24 budget presentation, but I can tell you that I will probably be here before you next year telling you a very similar story. And now I'm going to hand over the actual budget numbers to Mrs. Rothamick, so thank you.
I have one more. Um, I, I, sorry, I apologize for forgetting this. Um, you may have seen that the Weston Public Schools were paying $30,000 per pupil, and we were paying $15,000 per pupil. Um, if you look at niche rankings, they may be first in the state, but we are second. And again, I am proud to be the leader of this district. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, Susan Rothamick, Director of Finance. Um, moving on to the numbers. So the operating budget um, shows a salary increase of $3 million, um, about 5.4%, an expense increase of 1.3 million or 2.5% for a total increase of 4,415,000 or 7.9%. Next slide. We also offset the operating budget by user fees, such as parking, our uh, bus fees, uh, preschool tuition. So all of those revolving accounts, we're able to reduce the operating budget that comes to town meeting by $2.6 million. That's an increase of almost $500,000 from the previous year. And the increase really comes from the increase in Circuit Breaker, um, which is a reimbursement from the state. And lastly, the Special Education Reserve, um, which is Article 11, which was part of the consent agenda that you had already voted on, uh, funded at a rate of $1,094. Next slide. So again, looking at the operating budget that will be um, part of this article as um, Article 5, I believe, uh, 59937 Again, we offset that budget by $2.6 million. Special Education Reserve, which was already voted as part of Article 11. So the total to operate the uh, Hopkinton Public Schools is $63,728,000 for FY24. Looking at just the salary component, uh, contractual obligations represent 1.8 million and the staff requests are 1.1 million, getting back to what uh, Dr. Kavanaugh was stating in terms of increasing staff that are required for this budget. Next slide. Looking at uh, student services, it's an increase of 10.1 FTEs, that's full-time equivalent staff, an increased cost of 662,000. I apologize, but I can't read that far away. I'm gonna shift a little. <laughs> Uh, so it's 1.4 uh, for teaching, 3.9 for paraprofessionals, 3 for a director of curriculum and instruction, 0.4 for nursing, 0.6 for a social worker, and 0.8 for an admin assistant. For instructional cost and enrollment growth, we are requesting 7.25 positions, uh, increase of 465,000. That is for Marathon, 2.3, Hopkins, 3.35, Middle School, 1, and High School, 1.2, and these are in teaching. Instructional Program Enhancements, 1. This is Middle School, 1, High School, 1. Those are both media specialists. Middle School, a 1, Library, Para, Reduction. Admin Support, Middle School, 10-month guidance admin assistant, high school, 12-month guidance admin assistant, facilities, one custodian. High school will have a one 10-month guidance admin assistant reduction, and technology will have a 2.4 tech integration and website position reductions for a total request of 18.35. Uh, positions, again, the 1.1 million. Looking at just the expenses, again, the increase is 1.3 million. Next slide. Uh, for con 
contractual inflation and current services. We're looking at transportation. This is a new transportation contract increase of 179,000. Utilities, there are new electric and gas rates, and these have been offset by a new solar installation savings of 102,000. So that is an increase of 284,000. Athletics, a transportation increase and pool rental increase for 63,000, and then just miscellaneous others for 34,000. So the total for contractual in inflation is 562,000. Student services, $615,000 increase for transportation, 49,000 increase for tuitions, one thing that we are facing for the next fiscal year is out of district placements, um, tuitions were granted a 14% rate increase that is passed on to the schools. And there's miscellaneous other increases and this has been offset by the circuit breaker of 1.1. So student services increase is 669,000. Instructional cost and enrollment growth for transportation, we are adding an additional bus for 78,000 and technology leases that is part of the replacement cycle for 187,000. We are not having any instructional program enhancements and for administrative support and facility enhancements, we are actually decreasing um, the extraordinary maintenance for facilities. So again, we look at the budget in all those buckets that I kind of outlined for everyone. Mm -hmm. So the first line again, looking at both salary and expenses folded together, our contractual inflation and current services increase is 2.4 million. For special education is 1.3 million, that's the 10 positions. Instructional cost and enrollment growth, 653,000, the 7.25 positions. Instructional program enhancements, 119,000, that's one position. And the administrative support and facility enhancements at 116,000. Again, the total increase of 4.4 million. Next slide. Taking those same buckets, but breaking them into our percentage increase. So, so the so contractual the inflation. I just I just want to do a time check. Um, this this you you all are just about at 20 minutes. The last slide. The last slide. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. 4.4% uh, for contractual inflation. Mm -hmm. Special education 2.4%. Instructional cost mm -hmm. and enrollment growth 1.1%. Program enhancements, 0.2, and admin support and facility, a decrease of 0.2, again, for a 7.9% increase. Last slide. I, I don't know if you want to stay up there just in case questions come your way. So as a reminder, I know um, we've heard two presentations. If you have questions or comments, this is all on Article 5. You may approach the mic and please introduce yourself, your name and your address, please. Go ahead. Susan Stevenson, 3 Yale Road. What? Through me. Pardon me? You ask your question through me. Oh. I know. I forget the I know. Verbiage. It's confusing, so you, you just... Okay, I, I would like to know what impact the 14% increase is going to do, will happen to this year's budget or next year's budget, and what's your mind exploding with? <laughs> okay, so you're asking when, when is, like, when does this budget take effect? Okay. No. The 14% impact, when that takes effect. Okay. I do. Thank you. That's a, that's a great question. So the 14% increase um, in the tuition is part of this budget. So it does take effect July 1, 
uh, for our students and hopefully that will be a one-time correction that is made. Historically, the increase uh, is about two to three percent. We've never seen a 14 percent increase. So that would... uh, I'm sorry. The... I know. So you just ask back through me if you don't mind. Madam moderator. Yes. The question would be, therefore, the increase in budgetary amount is being caused in, in a portion because of the 14% increase. Is that a correct assumption, Madam Moderator? Mm -hmm. that, is, that is correct. The, that impact is part of the increase that is part of the school budget. OK. Anyone else with any questions? I see, I see people moving around. I just can't tell if you're moving up here or trying to find a seat or something. This is Sita Raman Ganesan, One Revolutionary Way, apartment number 106. Uh, per, per pupil expenditure is 15,000. That's what I saw from the slide. Uh, after 10th grade, kids move to private school. Um, so say if 20 kids uh, or 10 kids move to private school, that's a cost saving of uh, $150,000 for the school. So I mean, do we account that? Thank you. Okay. So you're asking, I'm not sure I understand the question um, because your, your question is if people leave, I mean, their budget is based on the number of students they have in, enrolled, and I think they build a, they build a model. Um, Carol, do, do you want to talk, I mean, maybe say something about the model, but, but someone leaving and going to private school is... So, sure, even though we talk about each of those students in a per-pupil expenditure kind of way, um, if students leave the Hopkinton Public Schools, when they go, it's not that $15,000 walks out the door each time. So, for example, if 40 students were to leave and we have 13 grade levels, K to 12, and three kids left each one of those grade levels, it, those 40 students would not impact us at all because three kids are leaving kindergarten, three are leaving grade one, three are leaving grade two, there would be no reason to eliminate a teacher or a paraprofessional or a speech and language pathologist, like all of those positions would remain intact. Thank you. So oh, sorry, you need to ask through me, please. Moderator, uh, so I would like to, I would like to know, uh, say if, uh, if 10 kid goes to private school, then that's uh, savings of like $150,000. How that fund is being accounted? Well, I, I think you just asked a similar question, and I think I think what we heard back is that there's no, there's not um, uh, necessarily pl advanced planning to be done for that. So they re the schools react to their enrollments. Um, I don't I don't know. Um, Tim, if there if there's some other answer that you think we would provide to this, I I, I think we just we do, we just can't anticipate when people will go, uh, you know, to a different school. So it's almost like you said, it's pretty much if people knock on your door and say I moved to town, then they're they're counted, right? So, so you know what. Um, I, I don't want to have a back and forth. I think you asked the same question sort of two different ways, and so I'll ask you to take a seat, and if you have another question, let's, uh, let's move on. Um, yes. Oh, I was just that, okay. uh, Leah Butler-Rafferty, member of school committee. I think um, 10 people, 10 kids leaving right now, we are at the end of, la of next year's projection. And the budget is based on the end of next year's projection. So 10 children leaving would not cause any change in the funding because we're technically already sort of behind. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Madam Moderator. My name is Carl Kalashevsky, 31 School Street. 
And um, first and foremost, I'd like to say I'm a proud citizen of Hopkinton, and I think that our education department is to be lauded very much. Having said that, during the budgetary process, and hearing some of the statistics going forward and looking for future planning in the area of the potential of 120 to anywhere from maybe even higher of $200 million in tax increases of anywhere from 30 to 50% in the next five years, it automatically puts pressure on senior citizens that can no longer afford these tax increases to support 50% or greater tax liability with no reciprocal town services. By citizens moving out, that derives, that these citizens, senior citizens derive little or no benefit from their tax revenue, you automatically welcome younger families that have children that totally benefit from tax dollars, compounding an ever-increasing school population. And self-fulfilling prophecy of forcing or if you will, tax benefit-wise, forcing out senior citizens that, number one, do not contribute to an ever-growing school population, and number two, contribute 50 to 60% of their tax dollars to get little fiscal benefit. So therefore, I urge the town of Hopkinton to consider the fact that these tax increases are a self-fulfilling prophecy because every year, and you're absolutely correct, you will come before this town meeting and there will be more and more people moving in and more and more people moving out that do not get the benefit from 50 to 60% of the tax dollars. Thank you. Thank you. Adam. Yes, Madam Moderator. My question. Uh, sorry, may you please introduce yourself with sorry, your. Sorry, Adam Monroe, 20 Holt Street here in Hopkinton. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my question for the administration is what I wasn't able to clearly understand was I understand that we have in the town uh, an increasing student population with increasing mental health issues. Uh, and my question centers around the budgetary um, allowances for those, for that increase in mental health issues for our students. Okay, so is that, I just want to make sure I understand the question is, are you asking like for a specific percentage or an amount or something, or what, what? What we're looking at for, an for, a, for a percentage increase um, and sort of what that general plan looks like for the future, because as we're you know, projected to increase our student um, capacity. Okay. Thank you for the question. So I'm really not prepared tonight to deliver sort of a report on that. But what I can say is each year we are adding more mental health support staff. So whether that's school adjustment counselors, social workers. This year in the budget you did see that we have a social worker that we have added in. And in particular, her role is to work with students but also to families. So sometimes you have kids who are school phobic or school avoidant. And what we really want to do is to make sure that those kids can get into school and be educated and sometimes that means that we're making sure that they have transportation or that they're fed and ready to learn. Um, if, you know, if the, at the school committee meeting we can always make a, some kind of a report on, you know, what is the plan, but in, in terms of keeping up with the enrollment and keeping up with the changes in demography that I think we've illustrated here tonight, uh, what we continue to do is to add people, but we also have programs. So we have programs that are behavioral in nature. We have programs that um, help our kids to get back into schools after hospitalization. Um, so there are multiple programs I, I could go on, but um, suffice it to say that they, they do exist, and I think we, we have good programs, and we are constantly building them and looking at them and analyzing the data for how do kids get in and hopefully how do they get out feeling better, uh, we call them alumni, and back into uh, mainstream academics so that they're not dependent on those programs. Thank you. Yes. Mike Tarosian, one colonial laugh. Can we move the question, please? Okay, so everybody understands what it means to move the question is then we don't entertain any additional comments. I didn't, I don't see anybody coming up with them. So is there a second to 
Okay. So all in favor of going to a vote? Aye. All opposed? Okay. So that means what we're doing is going to the vote. This is Article 5. We need a simple majority. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay. We had the simple majority. It was unanimous. <laughs> okay. Okay. We are uh, moving on to Article 6. I would like to ask Connor to step in for me so I can just step out uh, and take a quick bio break and I'll be back. Article 6 is FY24 revolving fund spending limits, uh, sponsored by the town manager. Do we have a motion? From the Appropriation Committee, we move the motion as printed in the Warrant Articles and Motions document. Amy Rutterbush, Select Board. Select Board recommends approval. Mike Manning, Appropriation Committee, recommends approval. Thank you. Mr. Manning, do you have a presentation? Yes. Uh, Hopkinton has established a number of self-sustaining revolving funds that are authorized to collect user fees and pay costs to provide certain services. These funds are commonly called 53 and a half funds as they are authorized by Massachusetts General Laws Chapter, chapter 44, Section 53 e and a half. The authorizing statute requires that town meeting be aware of and specifically approve the size and use of these funds each year by setting the maximum amounts that may be collected and spent within each authorized funds. Fund. There are no property taxes or other general revenues spent through these funds. If you look at the list, that most of these are the same year over year. We have to approve this every year. So there are a couple of items that have changed. One being the first item, the building department has gone from $300,000 to $500,000. The planning board has gone from $70,000 to $100,000. And finally, the police department has gone from $10,000 to $12,500. Thank you very much. Uh, does anyone have any questions or comments on the motion at hand? My name is Mary Armand at 51 Teresa Road. I'm sorry, but I really don't know what these revolving fund, the limits are here, but what are these items used for? Uh, just as an example, not knowing how they're spent, public safety 5,000, planning board 100,000, so I'd like some you know, explanation as to how the money is used. Uh, Mr. Manning or Mr. O'Leary, could you please just expand briefly on kind of what these funds are used for? Sure. Tim O'Leary, uh, Chief Financial Officer. So, Ms. Arnott, the, uh, for example, the building department, which is the largest fund, that one of the largest funds, the largest fund here, is for our building permits and fees that come into the building department when people apply, and then costs are incurred in issuing the building permits, and those expenses get paid out of that fund. They're not paid by money that's raised from your excise taxes or your property taxes. They're paid from that service specifically. Uh, that would also apply to uh, the cemetery commission, for example. They're authorized to inter people in the cemeteries. They collect a small fund and support that burial process. Another large one is the school laptop initiative. So that's not funded by the town. Parents who elect to buy into that program get their laptop from the schools. It gets supported by the schools. The cost of acquiring the laptop comes out of that fund. The cost, some staff cost for supporting that program comes out of the fund. And the student and parent get a laptop that's configured and works with the school protocols and school system, and it doesn't cost the property taxpayer anything. So, yeah. Thank you. So, through you, Mr. Moderator, then there's not only limits, but there's, always, there's also guidelines on how this money can actually be used. And that is overseen by someone 
Mr. Moderator, that's correct. The, the town accountant authorizes all expenditures from the town. Uh, it's a statutory responsibility and ensures that the revenue coming in is appropriate for the fund as it was established and that the expenses are relevant to the fund. It's also audited by our CPAs who come in once a year to look at us to make sure that we're compliant. And so there are several controls in place to ensure that uh, there's not side businesses going on within the town. Thank you very much. Uh, does anyone else have any comments or questions? Seeing none, we're going to go to a vote. Uh, this will require a simple majority. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? And that's unanimous and so carries. On to Article 7, PEG access and cable related fund revolving account funding. Uh, the sponsor is the town manager and does the Appropriations Committee have a motion? Appropriation Committee does have a motion. We move the motion as printed in the warrant articles and motions document. Okay. Amy Ritterbush, the select board recommends approval. The Appropriation, Mike Manning recommends approval. Thank you, Mr. Manning. Do you have anything to comment on for the topic? Uh, yes, as part of the cable TV licensing agreements, the town has negotiated with cable TV service providers to pay state authorized public asset access surcharges to the town to support PEG access. Under a provision previously passed by town meeting, these fees flow into a public educational and government access fund revolving account. Each year, town meeting must act to transfer the funds that have accumulated in the revolving account to a programming entity to support PEG access. In Hopkinson's case, that entity is HCAM, a local non-for-profit organization. This article would transfer $221,000 that has accumulated in the, that revolving account and provide it to HCAM to support community programming. To be clear, HCAM is an independent not-for-profit organization, not part of the town government. Thank you. Are there any questions? Seeing none, let's go to a vote. This is a simple majority. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? And it's unanimous and so it carries. At this time, I'm going to return the moderator's dais to our moderator, Ellen Rudder. Thank you. Thank you, Connor. Um, I think we are moving to Article 12. Okay. So we're moving to Article 12. Um, I think the, the motion is to come from appropriations, Mike. Okay, Article 12, Middle, Middle, Middlesex Regional Vocational Technical School District. We move the motion as written, the warrant articles and motions document. Amy Rutterbush, Select Board. Select Board recommends approval. Mike Manning, Appropriation Committee, recommends approval. If this article is supported by town meeting and a sufficient number of other communities that are served by key technical vocational school, the South Middlesex Regional Vocational School District could all an assessment of up to 5% of the town's annual tuition payment to support capital needs. That can mean contributions of about $28,000 at current spending levels. The Hopkinton School Committee is represented on the vo Regional Vocational Technical School District, and the community is well served by this educational alternative. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions or comments about this article? Seeing there are none, we'll move to a vote. We need a simple majority for this. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay, Article 12 passes unanimously. All right. Moving on to Article 13. Mary Jo Lafrenia, Select Board. Uh, this article pertains to a pilot agreement with the Solar Farm uh, 
off of Wilson Street. And a pilot agreement is an agreement, it means payment in lieu of taxes. And it's for the personal property, the equipment that they have up there that doesn't necessarily need to be taxed or, have to, or is allowed to be taxed. So we enter into pilot agreements with these people. And we have a very, very good one uh, with this one. They are going to be paying us for 25 years uh, a slight decline as the personal property declines. And uh, they like these agreements because they have a set rate and, and it tells them what they're going to be paying over the next 25 years. And the town is actually getting uh, funds from these people that they don't necessarily always collect or have to get. So uh, it's, it's an excellent agreement, and the select board recommends it. OK. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, do, do you want me to read the motion? I want to move the motion as written. Thank you. Uh, Mike? Appropriation Committee, Mike Manning, uh, we recommend approval. OK. Does anyone have any questions? OK. So we need a simple majority to approve Article 13. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? OK. Article. 13 passes unanimously. Okay, on to Article 14. I think this is with you, Mike. Article 14, pays you go capital expenses. We move the motion as written in the Warren Articles and Motions document. Okay. Amy Ritterbush, Select Board recommends approval. Appropriation Committee, Mike Manning recommends approval. Thank you. Mark Logan, CIC recommends approval on items one through 13 inclusive. Uh, the CIC did not take action on item number 14. This article proposes continuing the town's program of renewing capital infrastructure to the extent possible with existing cash resources that are available for appropriation, specifically $1.9 million from certified, certified free cash. The motion includes a list of 14 specific line items, line item projects requested by town departments. Each of these 18 items listed in the motion has been reviewed and discussed in public hearings by the Select Board, by the Appropriation Committee, and by the Capital Improvement Committee for requests over $25,000. OK. Does anybody have any questions? Madam Moderator, Mary Arnott, 51 Teresa Road. Just to be clear, this money is in addition to the town operating budget because they're capital expenditures? Um, go ahead. Um, Madam Moderator, Ms. Arnott, yes, that's exactly correct. Article 5 provided for the operating budget. This and the upcoming capital articles are additional spending for capital items. Uh, Madam Moderator, if I might have a follow-up question then through you, then this, uh, most of this would come out of uh, tax levies on residents? Madam Moderator, Tim O'Leary, Chief Financial <laughs> Officer. So this funding comes out of certified free cash, which comes from a number of places. All the money that got gathered last year from tax levy, from state aid, from excise tax, from, you know, from other sources, went into a pot and what wasn't spent at the end of last year went into an amount of certified free cash that our financial regulator, the State Department of Revenue, works with the town on and certifies each year. So maybe 70%, if it's a peanut butter spread, 72% of it or 74% of it was from residential property tax and 7% was from excise tax. And, but essentially, it comes from what wasn't spent from last year's tax base. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? OK. 
Okay, so we need a simple majority to pass Article 14. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay, I did hear a few op opposing, but we have enough for a simple majority. So 14 passes. Article 15. Article 15, Chestnut Seat Street Sidewalk. We move the motion as written in the Warrant Articles and Motions document. Amy Ritterbush, Select Board recommends approval. Mike Manning, the Appropriation Committee recommends approval. Mark Logan, CIC. He recommends approval. This article provides $514,250 to construct a new sidewalk on Chestnut Street from Wild Road to Smith Road through general obligation borrowing, also requiring a citizen vote allowing principal and interest to be excluded from the taxation limits imposed by Proposition 2 and a half. The projected fiscal year 20, the fiscal year 20 tax impact for principal interest payments on this proposed debt is just under $6 in the peak year for a homeowner with a Hopkins average house, which is valued at $753,000, $300. Any questions? I don't necessarily have a question. Is may it okay you to make oh, may you I'm introduce? I'm Anna I'm from 41 Smith Road. Thank um, you. And I was wondering if I could just make a comment. Yes. Um, so I live in Springwood, which is about a neighborhood of 175 homes. In addition to the homes that run up Chestnut and the roads that come off of it, I'm sure there's over 200 roads. Um, and out of all the roads that lead into our schools, primarily the middle school, the high school, um, outside of Granite Street, I believe it's the only major road that doesn't have a sidewalk that can get students safely um, to school. And I just want, before it's voted on, to know um, or let the community know, a few years back, one of our neighbors was hit by a car on his walk home from school. I happened to be pulling out of the neighborhood that day um, and saw him, um, you know, surrounded by people assisting him. Um, and so I think that a lot of the families that live along the area would really like to see a sidewalk so the kids can walk from home from school, especially when the bus isn't an option, and also gives other families the option to be able to walk into town. So I just wanted everyone to consider that when they take this vote. Thank you. Madam Moderator, Susan Conway, 32 Chestnut Street. Just curious what side of the street the sidewalk is going to be on. Do you know that at this point? Um, I know I don't know. Mm. Um, oh, I see someone who might know. Madam Chair, Gary Trendle, Planning Board, I can comment on that. Sure. Um, this would all be part of the design phase, which is incorporated into the cost, but we did do a preliminary walkthrough or walk of the, the site, and we anticipate the sidewalk would go on the south side. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay, so for Article 15, we need a two-thirds majority. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? I declare that we had two-thirds majority in that vo voice vote. Okay. Sorry, council has overruled. We are going to do a standing vote. Uh. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah. Connor, Connor Deegan, town clerk. So just to clarify, the reason being 
that this could require bond, and if so, bond council likes to actually see either a unanimous vote or a number. No me to vote again. <laughs> what? I can try it. Okay. Well, we'll, t we'll try another voice vote. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we are going to do a standing count. Please, if you're in favor, please stand up with your um, card. The folks in front, you may be seated. Middle, front, and um, uh, just middle, um, 81. Thank you. Middle, back, 78. Thank you. So everybody in the middle may be seated. Is he running, Jen? Well, we got a count over. We're off by one. <laughs> off by one. Yes. Do you have a count? Yes. Five. Okay, thank you. That's okay. May I ask that until we've secured the count, if you're voting yes, please please st stay up. Stage left, 110. Okay, thank you. The folks on this side may be seated. <laughs> I know, there's a lot of people. Madam moderator, folks on this side are standing along the wall. Can we just have people back in their seats to make the count? We're counting people twice because they're moving. Okay, yes. So it looks to me like folks are standing still now. So let's um, stay still, please, and they'll get the count done. Please, please wait until they announce the count to be seated. Thank you. 
90 to your right. Thank you. All those opposed, please stand and hold your card. Please stand and hold your card if you are on a name. Center one. Stage right two. Left three. Center back zero. Okay. And outside we had zero also. I'm trying to see my counter. Mm. To my counter, the counter for our, the cafeteria and the cable room, can she please confirm that there was zero nays? Were there zero nays? Zero. Thank you. This vote was 375 to six. That makes our two thirds majority and it passes. Article 16. Article 16, sidewalk EMC park to Blueberry Lane. We move the motion as written warrant articles and motions document. Amy Ritterbush, select board recommends approval. Mike Manning, appropriation committee recommends approval. Mark Logan, CIC recommends approval. This article provides $187,000 to construct a new sidewalk between EMC Park and Fitch Avenue, connecting Blueberry Lane through general obligation borrowing, also requiring a citizen vote allowing principal and interest to be excluded from the taxation limits imposed by Proposition 2 and a half. Okay, uh, hi. Hi, Mike Sullivan, 59 Theresa Road. I'm very familiar with EMC Park, and that my question is, where would the sidewalk Go. I know it goes to Blueberry Lane, but where would it be positioned on that land? Um, I see our expert here, um, Gary. Gary. Hi, Gary Trundle from the Planning Board. Um, so there is an existing trail that goes from uh, behind the skate park, uh, behind the, the fields and then goes down to, uh, eventually to Blueberry. In this case, it would go to Fitch. Clock's not working. Uh, I, I, my inquiry would be, is it literally gonna be a sidewalk or could a walking path be put in there? Um, let, let's ask the planning board. So it's a great question and um, Again, as part of this, uh, as part of this article, is is the design process to it. The the DPW has recommended uh, paving for this pathway, but again, this will all be part of the design process, which is included in the article. Uh, thank you. Just the thought for a natural path through the woods. They're usually thank nice. You. Thanks. Anne Matina, forty Eastview Road. I have a uh, kind of a contingent question, I guess, uh, as to that. First of all, it says here that it's going to be um, between EMC Park and Fitch Avenue. Is Fitch Ave does Fitch Avenue exist yet? <laughs> <laughs> That's a funny question. Let's have I Gary <laughs> answer that one. Gary Trendle from the Planning Board. Um, so Fitch Avenue is part of a previously approved okay. subdivision that would go behind Blueberry, so it has right. not yet been built. Okay. So I have one more question through you, <laughs> Madam Moderator, and that is, um, I, I'm wondering if this is all being considered with the new uh, elementary school building <laughs> folks. I can't picture in my mind if the Tadero property 
where it's situated on which side of Marathon School? Is it on the Blueberry, is it on the EMC Park side or is it on the other side? It, it just seems to me that we're, this is a comment, not a question. We're putting the cart before the horse. Seems like we need to do a few other things before we start paving through the woods. And I do support sidewalks. <laughs> Thank you. Do you have a comment? Yes, may I? Yes. Um, so there's there's a couple of things that are that are prompting this. Uh, the first is that we know it's it's much easier to put in a sidewalk or trail like this before the houses are built on Fitch uh, Fitch Avenue, uh, and then secondly, with the previously approved uh, skate park improvements, uh, it would be a more fluid design to incorporate this now. Um, from a connectivity perspective, one of the reasons that we prioritize this one is because it does provide much better access for the entire Blueberry Lane and associated neighborhood. It provides them a, a means to get to the schools um, and to get to the existing sidewalk. It also completes some really nice uh, loops, which we heard from all of our uh, user input and our, our pedestrian connectivity survey that people are looking for two to four mile loops, ideally for, for recreational activities. So. Um, that's why this is prioritized, and with regards to the question about where it's located, um, this is all north of the schools, so it doesn't have any, any impact between the potential new school and Marathon. Thank you. Yes. Uh, John Graziano, 8 Kimball Road, uh, chair of the elementary school building committee. Just building on what Gary said, um, this certainly wouldn't impact the location of the proposed school. Um, but one of the things that we are focused on with the project is increasing walkability to the schools, and this uh, sidewalk would give at, would allow us to move towards several parcels um, that would uh, that would open up neighborhoods to walk to the new school as well as the schools in that area. So when we talk about reductions in traffic, um, the sidewalk would also have the, the benefit of being able to increase the walkability factor. Thank you. Does anyone else have any comments? Okay. So this is sort of similar to the last one that we just went over. In our vote, we need a two-thirds majority. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? I'm going to call that two-thirds majority. <laughs> Moving on to Article 17. Article 17, Fire Station 2, Architectural and Engineering Design. We move the motion as written in the Warrant Articles and Motions document. Amy Ritterbush, Select Board, recommends approval. Mike Manning, Appropriation Committee, recommends approval. Mark Logan, CIC, recommends approval. The article provides $70,000 to support architectural and engineering design for a new second fire station in the Woodville neighborhood. If successful, there will be additional costs proposed for actual construction in future years. The funding would be obtained through general obligation borrowing, also requiring citizen vote, allowing principal and interest to be excluded from the taxation limits imposed by Proposition 2 and a half. Is there anyone who has any questions or, or comments on Article 17? Okay, so we need a two-thirds majority for this. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? No. We're gonna do a vote, standing vote, please. This time I'm gonna do it um, 
the other way because we know about how many people are here all opposed please stand up and hold your um, hold your yellow card please Center middle, four. Left, zero. Center back, one. Stage right, ten. I'm trying to see. Um, did I'm trying to find Sally? <laughs> did you go? I'm trying to find the Nicole. Do you see Sally out there? Is she? Um, there she is. Zero. Thank you. So let's all stand up and not move a lot so the people can count you really quickly because I need to have a number. We have 16 no's and let's figure out how many yeses we have. Please stand up. People in the front may be seated. Five. Thank you. Eighty-five, stage right. Eighty-five. Thank you. Center back, sixty-six. Center middle, 81. Thank you. Stage left, 108. Okay, this was 355 to 16. Three hundred and fifty-five, yay, sixteen, nay. The article passes. Okay. All right. By my accounting, we are now on Article Twenty-Three. Um, 
Okay. Sorry, I made a mistake. We're on Article 18. Article 18, Hopkinton Public School Heating, Ventilation, Air Conditioning, Renewal Work. We move the motion as written in the Warrant Articles and Motions document. Amy Ritterbush, Select Board recommends approval. Mike Manning, Appropriation Committee recommends approval. Mark Logan, CIC recommends approval. This article provides $1,506,259 to support a round of climate management equipment for the, and control system replacements for the school district. The funding would be obtained through general obligation borrowing, also requiring a citizen vote allowing principal and interest to be excluded from the taxation limits imposed by Proposition 2.5. Okay, does anyone have any any questions about Article 18? Okay, seeing there are none, we need again two-thirds majority. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? Given the size of this, I believe we're going to need to count. We'll switch it around and we'll do this, the standing for yes first, please. Folks in front may be seated. Center middle, 65. Stage right, 80. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Center back, 65. Thank you. Stage left, 96. Thank you. <laughs> yes, five for the outside. Okay. Just uh, re uh, request to not sit down until the area is called. Okay, thank you for that reminder. Okay, so now we're asking people who say nay, please stand up and hold your card until we let you know you've been counted. You have to stand up. Yes, you have to stand up for it to count. Center middle two. Left one. Center back zero. Outside zero. Thank you.
Deidre H7. This carries 323 to 10. Okay, we're moving on now to Article 19. Article 19, Hopkins School Edition. We move the motion as written in the Warrant Articles and Motions document. Amy Ritterbush, Select Board recommends approval. Mike Manning, Appropriation Committee recommends approval. Mark Logan, CIC recommends approval. Okay, this requires two thirds majority and as, as we've heard for the bigger um, dollar amounts, we, are going to need numbers or, or a unanimous vote. So I just want everyone to feel comfortable with what they're voting. Uh, we need a two-thirds majority. So on Article 19, those in favor, please say, sorry. Yeah, sorry. I jumped. So this this article provides $3 million to support planning and design for an expansion of the Hopkins School, with $2,200,000 to come from the School Stabilization Fund and $800,000 to be obtained through general obligation borrowing, also requiring a citizen vote, allowing principal and interest to be excluded from the taxation limits imposed by Proposition 2 and a half. Okay, I don't know if people might have questions about uh, about how that works. Would that mean that that extra part would be on the ballot? Yes. So yes, it's the 800,000 that is on the ballot. Okay. Did, yes, go ahead, Ken. Ken Weissmantle, 145 Ash Street. Madam Moderator, my question is, is if this is for engineering and design, what are the big budget items of what the construction might cost us? And which year are they expecting that that's going to be asked to do that? Mm, do you want to, one of you want to take that? Josh, can you bring up the slides for this article, please? Thank you. So as we've talked a lot about tonight, uh, there is increased enrollment in the Hopkinton Public Schools currently. We have about 300 students in grade five and 345 in grade four. So there are 645 students at the Hopkins School right now. That school was built for uh, not that many children. So we are over capacity even while we are here this evening. Um, as Mr. Manning said, this is really for design and engineering. Um, $2.2 million is coming out of the school stabilization fund. We're asking you for $800,000. What you're seeing on this next slide shows you that regardless of whether the Hopkins School remains a 4-5 or five school, or if it becomes a 5-6 school is irrelevant to this vote, because our demographers are predicting that there will be 802 students if it's a 4-5 school and 803 students if it's a 5-6 school. So we are looking very carefully at this and um, we've done the demographic projections on it and I'm going to ask Mrs. Rothermick to talk about the cost for this particular project. Next slide, Josh. Thank you. Uh, so what we are looking for today uh, at this town meeting again is the 800,000 that would be town meeting 2.2 million will be coming from the school stabilization 
and you can see what that timeline, this will bring us through due diligence, through construction documents and permitting um, up to May of 24. The May of 24 town meeting, what we are looking at orig or estimates at this time is approximately 43 million in that construction. Um, and you can see that would be requested at the May 24 town meeting. Of course, that's after the design that really would refine this number. This is an estimate. And that would get us a potential occupancy for January of 26. And as Dr. Kavanaugh uh, noted earlier, where our enrollment projections are going from 630 approximately upwards to 800. So you can um, see the need for expediency with this. So that answers the first gentleman's question on potential cost. Uh, thank you. Go ahead. Madam Moderator, Carl Kalashevsky, 31 School Street. Um, it was my understanding in Article 1 when we heard a report that there was a committee to oversee the use of all school properties so that they could take a look at an overview of all of this rather than doing this as it looks like piecemeal. So I'd like to know how this fits in with that recommendation on the May 24th committee to oversee the use of all town properties. Um, I, I believe that was, what was the name of that group? The, the, the center the school? Permanent, the permanent building committee, I Correct. apologize. So um, they are looking at town properties that are, I believe, not currently being used by the school. So the Elmwood school could potentially be vacated if um, town meeting does pass for a new Elmwood school project uh, to go on Hayden Row, that that permanent building committee is looking at what then would be the reuse of the existing Elmwood school. What we did for our school buildings as they exist is we did a district-wide study that looked at these enrollment projections and what our existing capacity can handle and what needs to be done at each school building. And this Hopkins School is one of those first additions. The Elmwood School Project, you heard the um, other report, which was the Elmwood School Building, Elementary School Building Committee 2. That was their report on where they are with Elmwood and this is Hopkins. So it is separate from the permanent building committee that is looking for your feedback on the Thank 24th. You. Um, with all this due respect, additional question, Madam Moderator? Sure. Um, this is like Chinese water torture. Um, <laughs> the, for, the previous motion at one and a half million dollars and three million dollars over here, uh, proposition over two and a half override, I'd like someone to uh, explain to me or about, give me a rough estimate of what this is going to do on the effect on my tax bill for the real estate property. Tim. Hi, Tim O'Leary, CFO, so I'm the lucky person who gets to answer this question. You are. Uh, there's a graph in the Appropriation Committee report on page 30 that shows the entire five-year capital plan, and it shows a big increase in what it would mean to an average homeowner who has a $753,500 uh, house. We have some supplemental slides, Josh. If you can bring up my slide five, the finance backup slides. It shows a table of the impact of, of borrowings. And it puts the average home on the second line up. Uh, maybe that's not the right one. OK, well, if you can get it up, you can get it up. But for the average home, for a $100 million borrowing, it would add $726 to the tax bill. In the peak year, 
if we get a 2% interest rate, which we were getting a couple years ago, if we get a 4% interest rate during a time of high uh, interest rates, it would be half of a $995 bill. So about $445 on the tax bill if you get 4% and uh, half of that 726 number in TAN in the upper block if you get 2%. So this would be about a $44 million, roughly half of a $100 million borrowing. So that's what it would cost every homeowner. So approximately, um, we, we, would that be $726? No. That's for $100 million. Okay. So about a half of that. So three, you know, 363, 350. That's at 2%, and you can see how it would be more Correct. if we end up paying 4% on the borrowing. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Um, let's let this gentleman ask his Jeff question. Jeff Barkley, 16 Oliver Lane, uh, through the moderator. I just have a question on this. Do you have enough room on that site? With a, that's, and the reason I asked the question, I was on the Conservation Commission when that building was permitted and I thought you have a pretty tight site. I, I have no problem with the, doing it, but I have a problem with you have the, the footprint there to build it on, because you're going to lose all your parking, potentially. Uh, that's correct. The, the site is a challenge. And we did um, initiate right away with the town to ask some questions on our wetland delineation. The area that we're looking at is actually bringing the building out to where the basketball courts are, the existing courts. Um, what we're looking at is really the play fields because then that takes away parking, it takes away play fields for the, the students. So that will become a challenge in, in trying to um, accommodate both the building and play fields for the students. Moderator, I have a, then I just have a comment. I just, sure. Things like this are fine, but it just seems to me, I think you want to make sure you have the footprint before you create a problem where you have to say, we need more wetlands because we need the school, because that site has already gone through that permitting process. That's my real concern there, okay? Thank no, you. And, and that's correct, and that's why this um, first year is will take us all the way through permitting so that we do know what we're faced with. Madam Moderator, Ken Weissmantle, 145 Ash Street. Through you, uh, mm -hmm. Madam Moderator, has anyone looked at just keeping Elmwood School open for, you know, we're going to build a re kind of a replacement. Why not keep that building? It's got a lot of students in it. So with the uh, Elmwood School, uh, the, the building project, what we are looking at is that really is a end of life replacement. So while you can house students, you can't house them for the true academic needs. When we looked at the district wide study, um, which does look at all schools, one of the things that I was passed on to the Permanent Building Committee as they're looking at the Elmwood School in the future is the potential of moving the preschool program over to the Elmwood School because the Marathon School will also be projected to need more space. So one of the things that we would need to do or look at, um, which will require further study, is what if we relocated the preschool over to the Elmwood School. So there are, there are considerations um, for that building that I believe will be going through that permanent building committee process. Are there any other questions? Mary Arnott, 51 Teresa Road, Madam Moderator. Um, trying to get the whole big picture on this. Do we have the land and, that would accommodate 
a larger building over by the Marathon School for the new Elm, Elmwood Replacement School, that somehow there's more land over there that we could configure things rather than trying to fit an addition to Hopkins School, and we may find out we can't do it because of permitting and wetlands and other things. Um, do we need to step back for a minute and say, maybe let's put some of this money into Marathon, Elmwood over on that property and, and build there rather than trying to do it here? So thank you. As we have been working with the Massachusetts School Building Authority, the MSBA, who are our partners in the, pro the Elmwood Project and who will reimburse us at somewhere around 25% of the cost, we had an option to either replace Elmwood with a 2-3 school or a 2-3-4 school. And we chose a 2-3-4 school because we would be getting the additional reimbursement from the MSBA on the additional grade level. If you free up that space by pulling grade four out of Hopkins, now you can move grade six into Hopkins with grade five, so you're freeing up middle school space as well. I know that as, in, and it's irrelevant again, whether you have four or five or five, six in the Hopkins school, the same number of children will be there. Currently, Elmwood and Hopkins are both overcrowded, over capacity. When Mrs. Rothermick was talking about a $43 million price tag on the Hopkins School, that's an estimate. We don't really know that that's how much that building is going to cost, and we won't know the cost until we go through this design and engineering study. And you know, I know that as we keep throwing these numbers out to you, they, they feel like an awful lot of money. And I am certainly empathetic and understanding of what impact that has on your tax bills. But you have so many children in this district right now, and you don't have the physical space for them. Um, so to go back to it, what we're really asking for is $800,000 to be appropriated for a design and engineering study. That will let us know. We believe right now we can extend that building on the Hopkins site. The question is really play space. Yes. Gary Trendle, 31 Chamberlain Street. Uh, question through you, Madam Moderator. Uh, is there a less expensive option to assess feasibility than the $3 million price tag that comes along with this one? Uh, well, again, this takes you all the way through design development, so we will have set plans, so it, it goes beyond feasibility. Uh, Madam Moderator, Joe Heist, 17 Clinton Street. Uh, very simple question, what capacity are we designing for? Uh, so if the anticipated number is 803 students by 2032, how big are we planning this addition? Is it going to be 1,000, 1,200? How far are we trying to build this out? Uh, it's approximately 23,000 square feet addition. I think, I think the Sorry. question was for the number of, of students that um, you would be um, designing for. Head, head count, yes. Yes, we're, we are designing for that 800 student population. And if I may, Madam Moderator, so eventually 10 years from now we'll be out of capacity again? Well, the 10-year projection is the 800 students. Thank you. Yes. Um, Berwan Hussain, 24 Nazine Circle. Uh, instead of making a new school, why don't you guys use the old center school at, at Levinas Street, then near the Hopkins State uh, the marathon starting line. So I think the question is, could we could we reopen the center school? Uh, so I think you heard uh, the initial report from the permanent building committee um, first that really does deem the center school buildings as not viable at this time. Stuart Floyd, Two Hoyt Way, motion to call the question. Did, did you have something that was materially different than things that have already been said? Well, motion to call. 
Okay, so fo folks who don't know, this means that we're not gonna keep talking. We're gonna, we're gonna vote, so can I hear a second? I think I heard one. All in favor of moving to a vote? Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Pardon me? Yes. So it's unanimous, we're moving to a vote. This is Article 19. We need two-thirds majority. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? Yay. Okay, we're gonna do a standing vote. Um, I see people moving around. Please take your seats so you can be counted. All in favor, please stand up and hold your, your yellow. You can sit down, Connie. Folks in the front may be seated. Center middle, 52. Center back, 56. Outside, three, and one abstain. Left, 93. Thank you. We're just going to stay here. On your right, 59. So I think everybody can be seated. And then those folks who are voting no, please stand up with, with your card. Center back, 11. Thank you. Center, 25. Stage right, 24. Okay, I think that's everybody.
Okay, I have 275 to 65. That is, that is two-thirds majority. Okay. I'm IC 22 now. Okay, we're moving on now to Article 22. I'm sorry, yes it did, it passed. 275 to 65, that is a two-thirds, a more than a two-thirds majority. All right, so now we're moving on to Article 22, the school committee. Uh, who from the school committee is moving this article? Nancy Cavanaugh from the school committee. I uh, move the, the article as written. Do you want? For the, okay. Do you want me to? And you recommend? It? Oh yes, the approval? school committee. The school committee recommends approval. Yes. Sure. And yes, please do read. Oh. <laughs> and Mike, <laughs> Mike Manning. Do you want me to read the? Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Mike. Yep. Mike Manning from Appropriation Committee recommends approval. Thank you. Uh, Madam Moderator, do you want me to read the um, article or the motion? Um, why, don't you, why don't you read the motion, please? So we move pursuant to Mass General Law C30B12B to authorize the superintendent of schools or a designee thereof to enter into a contract or contracts for di digital curriculum, educational programs, educational courses, mm -hmm. educational curricula yeah. in any media, yeah. including yeah. online textbooks, educational software, newspapers, serials, periodicals, audiovisual materials, or software maintenance. Ne Sorry, Nancy, yep. I don't want to. Um, interrupt you. I was just um, told that since you're moving what's already yes. written here, do, do you want to say like um, a sentence about like the summary of what this is? Yes. Th this is to authorize the superintendent and the schools to extend contracts up to six years. It, it, it would allow us to appreciate some savings. Okay. For things Thank like... Thank you. Okay, um, does anyone have any questions? All right, so we'll need a simple majority for this one. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay, simple majority, unanimous. We are now moving into the section of Community Preservation Funds, Article 23. Article 23, Community Preservation Funds. We move the motion as written in the warrant article of the motion doc motions document. Um, Amy Ritterbush, Select Board rec recommends approval of Article uh, 23. Mike Manning, Appropriation Committee, recommends approval. Ken Weissmantel, Chair of the Community uh, Preservation Committee, recommends approval. This article reserves an amount totaling $1,925,000 for community preservation from estimated fiscal year 2023, 2023 receipts as shown in the motion by recommendation of the Community Preservation Committee. Yes. Madam Moderator, I'd like to explain the article. 
Okay. Do you mind introducing yourself yes. again just for the... Ken Weissmantle, 145 Ash Street, speaking as chair of the Community Preservation Committee. First of all, I'd like to thank the hardworking members of our uh, committee. Uh, they've had hearings uh, all this last uh, fall on, I'll say, the next article that we're going to recommend. Mm -hmm. I'd also like to thank the town manager and our admin, Shannon uh, Soros, for their great support. This is the money that you get from the 2% surcharge on your taxes, which is also maxed by a match by the state of, I'm going to say, roughly 40%, or at least in the high 30s. Uh, this article basically puts it into buckets where we can spend it at future town meetings. By law, we have to put 10% into historic preservation, uh, open space, community housing, and recreation. And that's what this does. The other 60% is into a uh, basically an undesignated amount, which can be spent on any of those four purposes. Uh, the other thing I'd like to mention is CPC. This fall will begin uh, our hearing process, and we'll be accepting uh, requests for funding from spending this money that you're putting it into the buckets now. Does anybody have any questions about Article 23? Madam Moderator, Mary Arnott, 51 Teresa Road. So I'm reading from a report on the Community, community Preservation Fund, and it says that um, with $1,805,300 in new collections and anticipated state matching funds, the CPF balance available for future appropriation will be $8,255,916 if town meeting approves the projects proposed in this budget. So I guess I would like to know how is that $8 million, is it being invested? Um, where does it sit? At what point might it be spent? Or how do we accumulate so much um, when we have all these other things that are going on in town? Uh, I assume the accumulation is just from the assessment on our properties. So I kind of like to know a little bit about the $8 million before I decide if I want to vote on this. Okay. Tim? Madam Moderator, Tim O'Leary, the CFO. The best presentation of this information is on the Appropriation Committee Report, page 39, and you see that 8.3 number is most of the way down on the right-hand side. So that is money that is accumulated over time from this 2% surcharge in the state match, which has not met the standard to be expended by the CPC committee and by town meeting. So it is accumulated. Things get spent every year, but the balance is accumulating over time. Not much last year at town meeting, the balance was 7.8 million, and it's risen about a half a million dollars to 8.3. So that's money that is available and is there. It is town uh, deposits in the custody of the town treasurer collector. Uh, the town typically has 40 to $80 million in cash at any one time. That comes in because we have uh, cyclical property tax payments and intermittent payments of excise tax, and we have an even spend. So we get peaks of money, but we spend fairly evenly. The town treasurer invests that money. Lately, most of our money has been in the Mass Municipal Depository Trust, earning about 4.7% interest. So we're actually doing fairly well on our deposits right now. The treasurer will hold that money and preserve that money and earn good returns on it until CPC and the town meeting decide what to spend it on. Thank you, uh, Madam Moderator. Then if we don't seem to have the projects to spend the money on, it's just going to sit in the you know, investments? Or is there possibly uh, maybe we don't have to assess properties an additional 2% for the CPC and wait till we start using some of this money before we, you know, let's spend the $8 million if we have to and save the taxpayers some money on their property taxes. 
Can, can you address that? Yes, ma'am, Madam Moderator. Uh, so the town adopted this 2% surcharge to go to the CPC things, and we would have to go through some kind of process to unadopt it and suspend it. It's not something that can be administratively done by the select board or the town manager or the tax collector or the CPC committee. We would have to go through the process that we did to adopt it, to unwind it. We'd also lose the matching money, which is beneficial in the long run to us. So, but it could be an option if someone wanted to propose that in the future. Okay, thank you, Madam Moderator. I appreciate the fact that we might not want to lose this money. I just would like to know that at some point we're going to spend eight million dollars on something very valuable, and you know, and not wait twenty years for that to be used. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yes, Madam Moderator Ed Harrow, Chair of the Open Space Preservation Commission. Uh, I speak. Uh, Firstly, to the efforts of Norman and the CPC to procure for us properties that we can buy. Mm -hmm. And as you well know, if you've tried to buy real estate, it's a complicated process. And the one thing you need to have is money in the bank. We've got the money in the bank when we get the process completed. And I'm hoping we're going to have at least one, this town meeting, uh, piece of property that we're going to inquire. We need to have the money there to do this when we get the stuff. So I thank you for your support, and I thank Norman and the CPC for their hard work this year. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else have anything on Article 23? This one will pass with a simple majority. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? This passed unanimously. Okay. Okay. All right. We're moving on to Article Twenty Four. Madam Moderator, Ken Weissmantle, 145 Ash Street, speaking as chair of the Community Preservation Committee. Uh, in order to uh, do this article, uh, we've uh, we broke it into three, three motions, one of which we already did with the consent. So the first motion, which is uh, on page 23 of the motions and uh, uh, the Warren Articles and Motions document, and I would uh, move it as written in the document. Muriel Kramer, Kramer for the Select Board. We recommend approval. Mike. Mike Manning, Appropriation Committee. Uh, recommends approval. Mark Logan, CIC, recommends approval. Ken Weissmantle, uh, Community Preservation Committee, recommends approval. Madam Moderator, can I explain what we're spending here? Yes. Okay, we are spending. Uh, some of that money that we put in the buckets last year and what we kind of did just a moment ago. The two highlight on this portion is a million dollars for a little league and cricket pitch. Uh, that's kind of the big, that's the big ticket item this year. Uh, and this will get us a uh, cricket pitch uh, on Fruit Street with uh, uh, a little league field that's been redone and a bunch of parking which is also needed in there. Uh, the second big one is improvements to our affordable housing, uh, particularly their outdoor space, and that's $350,000. Uh, we have some money for preservation of historical records, $40,000 there, $30,000 for boundary marking on some open space properties. 5,000 for a trailhead parking on Ash Street. Um, 5,000 for uh, uh, 
some trail board rock walks and bridges. Uh, $60,000 to add to our dog park, uh, which was done in with CPC money in the last couple of years and has been very successful and we need some more shade and more benches over there. Uh, $25,000 for additional security cameras uh, for Sandy Beach and the Fruit Street Athletic Fields. Uh, and then $40,000 for uh, preliminary uh, trail uh, portion on the western route and 48,000 for recreation reserve uh, for preliminary engineering on the part of the trail that kind of goes through uh, Legacy Farms. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, the vote needed for, for this motion one within this article is a simple majority. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, this passes unanimously. Madam Moderator, I would like to uh, move as written in the motions document, or warrant in motions document, uh, page 25, motion number two. Muriel Kramer for the select board. We recommend approval. Mike Manning, Appropriation Committee, recommends approval. Mark Logan, CIC, recommends approval. Ken Weissmantle, CPC, CPC, recommends approval. Ed Harrell, Open Space Preservation Commission, nobody asked, but we recommend approval. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I can attest that this is one of the most remote pieces of property in town, and if you are looking for a place to get lost, where no one will find you, this is the place to go. I recommend it highly. <laughs> I don't know. Who's got something to top that? <laughs> Madam Moderator, basically, as Ed just said, it is out in the middle of nowhere, but it's in the middle of nowhere uh, bounded by the Hopkinton State Park and kind of off behind uh, uh, Saddle Hill, but way behind Greenwood, I mean, way, way behind there. Uh, basically, uh, the current owners inherited this piece of property. They gave the town a very good deal with this. Uh, we're going to spend a lot of money probably surveying uh, to, to, to find it and to lay it out. <laughs> Uh, and uh, basically, uh, this will be a piece of open space. But uh, basically, we were hoping to buy a bunch more property that we're, we thought we had some willing sellers. We didn't quite get there on all those. I'm sure we'll keep working on all those, and we'll probably be spending a good chunk of uh, the money if we're successful in negotiating more land purchases. Okay, so d is there any other questions? It doesn't look like it. So um, this requires a two-thirds majority. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? I'm sorry, did I hear one? Did I hear a nay? I didn't, I didn't think so. Okay, so we got a unanimous. Um, vote on this. Given that it is we should start. Okay. Okay. All right, we're going to move on to uh, zoning bylaw amendments. Article 25. Madam Moderator, Gary Trendle, Planning Board. Uh, we move, uh, Article 25, we move that the town vote to amend the zoning bylaws of the town of Hockington as set forth in Article 25 of the 2023 Annual Town Meeting Warrant. And the Planning Board recommends approval. Did you, did you want to say anything about this? 
Yeah, let me just explain this really quickly. This is not the simplest of articles, but um, the proposed article will reduce the threshold for which development, developments will be required to provide affordable units from 10 units to five units. The requirement for a special permit will be removed except in instances where the developer seeks to locate the affordable units off-site or wants to make a payment in lieu of affordable payments. Each development over five units will be required, uh, will require 10% of the units to be affordable and fractional units will round up to the nearest whole number for affordable units. So for example, a 12 unit subdivision would require two affordable units. Um, I think it's worth noting and you know, um, one of our goals is to make sure that we maintain affordable housing stock of 10% or higher. Uh, if we drop below that 10% threshold, then we become, uh, then we have some potential for what's called a 40B development, or an unfriendly 40B, which means that, that we as a local jurisdiction lose, uh, lose control over what's being, what's being built. So the way to avoid that is to maintain this 10% threshold. And this article makes a couple of really important changes for us. Um, I already mentioned that it reduces the threshold from 10 units to five units. So currently if someone's building eight or nine units, uh, none of them are affordable, that effectively um, decreases our percentage of affordable units in town. Um, it also, um, uh, currently a developer can, uh, can make a payment in lieu of, they can build an affordable unit on site or build an affordable unit off site. And um, this would, would change that so that uh, they'd be required to build it on site uh, unless they were granted a special permit um, by the planning board. Okay. Does anybody have any, any questions about this article? Uh, this is Kiara Lu, through the moderator. Uh, can you elaborate a little more about the benefits of this? What, what are we losing if we don't do this? How, how do we lose control of something? I just need to hear more details. Thank you. So if we were to drop below that 10% threshold, then a developer could come in uh, with what's called an unfriendly 40B. And what that allows is that allows them to bypass all of our local zoning ordinances and build something that, uh, that still has to go through a, a state review process, but doesn't have to comply with Hopkins local zoning. Hi. Hi, uh, Robert Benson, 178 Spring Street. Uh, member of the planning board, but talking as a citizen. So I think this is, could have positive effects for the planning board to give us control over new development. But the potential damaging impacts for any future new developments and the revenue impact and tax impact, any new development, um, like right now in Hopkinton, there's nine single family homes that are affordable housing units. They're all assessed value at about $200,000. So if you build, if a developer wanted to build a $1 million house or a $1.5 million house next to a $200,000 house, they're not gonna be able to sell that for 1.5 million or $2 million. So every house in that neighborhood would be worth, worth less money. So all the houses would have to be smaller. So the potential tax impact here is significant and all residents would have to be subsidizing that future tax loss. The, the impact here is the tax revenue from property tax in Hopkins is 82% of the revenue in town. And if we do this, we don't know what the impact's gonna be. I think it's gonna be a negative impact on any new future developments, which will negatively impact everybody's property value that already lives in town. So if new homes being built aren't worth as much, your home that you live in now isn't gonna be worth as much. So this is gonna have dramatic unknown effect, in a, and I believe it's gonna be in a negative way on everybody's property value. And we just heard potential for taxes going up 50%. This is not gonna help that situation. We see $40 million for a new Hopkins School Edition, $150 million for Emerald School Replacement or higher. This is not going to help that situation. If anything, it's going to be a negative. Imagine an 11 uh, home neighborhood where two houses are affordable units. Everybody here that's not in an affordable house is going to be subsidizing that. Thank you. Peter Thomas, 215 Pond Street, through the moderator. Um, I think that the effect of this uh, will be to slow development. 
Um, ultimately, uh, this will cause developers to have to be more creative in their development. And, um, you know, as a result, I think that you will see overall less construction in the town. So if that is what you want in Hopkinton, as many people do, you should vote for this. Steve Popk is 24 Cedar Street Extension. It is true that we would end up subsidizing this. I think that's a good thing, not a bad thing. Uh, I think we have a problem right now with a huge building boom and I would argue inflationary prices. This might serve as a damper to that, which might have a tax impact, but we have a problem with housing and we, this is a way to address it. So I propose voting for it. Mary Arnott, 51 Trees Road, Madam Moderator. Um, I was just wondering about the rounding up. Um, I know we're trying to do some things to control development and maintain control so we don't have the 40B situation, but if a developer develops 12 units, I could see it reasonable that they would have to provide at least one affordable unit, but if it's 1.2 and we tell them, well, you gotta provide two affordable units now, I'm not sure why we're rounding up. I mean, even the IRS lets you round down if it's 1.4. So I would just ask maybe a little bit more explanation on that, and could that be changed? Um, okay. Um, okay, do you have an answer to that quickly? Okay. Hey, Gary Trendle from the Planning Board. The reason we're rounding up is because we want to make sure that we uh, do not negatively impact that percentage of affordable housing. So in the case of 12 units, if we build, if there's a 12 unit uh, subdivision and we only add one affordable, then the actual net percentage goes down. And we wanna make sure that net percentage actually goes slightly up. Thank you. Oh, people. Uh, Stacy Spies, 16 Alexander Road. Um, and I'm in favor of this. You don't want a 40B. It, that's when you don't have control over the density or the siting or what it looks like or all of that. So when you're talking about having control over building, a 40B is the exact opposite of what you want. You want to have local control over what's going on. And I have no problem with more affordable housing. Thank you. Peter Thomas, 215 Pond Street. Thank you again, Madam Moderator. Sorry, um, I, I need to interrupt you because this, this woman hasn't had a chance to speak yet. So after she speaks, you can, you can speak again. Yes. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Jack Miller, 111 Main Street. As a person who lives in town and also works in town, having affordable housing makes it so the folks who do work as public servants, teachers, all sorts of... Um, not the most affluent in town, but educated and willing to contribute to the same tax base that we are all pulling from, it makes it so we can afford to continue to live in town and have the same opportunities that everyone else has. Thank you. Thank you. So, sorry, there is a person behind you who hasn't spoken on this. So, uh, you will have a chance. Or you may have a chance. And Matina <laughs> 40 Eastview Road. I just wanted to say that I support this article for the reasons already stated and to also point out that town meeting a couple of years ago, we there was a, a movement to uh, put a moratorium on building in town and of course that got shot down. Um, but I think that we have to recognize that we just can't keep building and the other part of this is we can't keep building houses that are on two acres and sell for two million dollars. It's just, it's not feasible. And um, for exactly the reasons why the previous speaker just spoke, uh, cited in her um, comments as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, Harry Roberts, 23 Connolly, Connolly Hill Road. Madam Moderator, how close are we to that threshold that that would be invoked? So how serious is this problem that we need to invoke something such as this? Uh, Gary Trendle, Planning Board. We don't have an answer for you yet because the, the number will be based on the 2020 census figures, which we are set to receive uh, later this month. 
but the last time we calculated it was around 14% and we anticipate it's going to be something less than that, although still above the 10%. So it's getting closer to 10%, but we don't yet know how much and we won't know until uh, the end of the month. But more follow-up question, shouldn't we get the, the facts first before we make a proposal that we don't know if we're in violation or we're hitting that 10% first before you, you propose something? It, it just sounds like the timing is, is such that we don't have those numbers yet. Yes, sir. Uh, Mike Rowan, Six Hayden Row. I'm chairman of the Historical Commission. I believe this um, motion is brilliant because what it will allow is there's not a lot of uh, open space available. What developers will do will find a property that has existing structures on it. And in this case, I think it's a good way to combine preserving small existing structures for the affordable or attainable uh, 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 residents, and then you can build your McMansions uh, adjacent to it. So I think it's a good balance. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Susan Curry's 29 Forest Lane. Um, I am speaking in favor of the article. Uh, aside from whether or not you want affordable housing, um, affordable housing is required in Massachusetts. And I see this article as not um, saying more or less, but it's giving the town some control over the town being able to direct the development of that housing rather than have the state come in and permit a developer to build something of their own design and style that is not in keeping with the type of community that we want to have. So I speak in favor of the article. Thanks. Peter Thomas, 215 Pond. Thank you again, Madam Moderator. This is not a, a, an issue with whether we want affordable housing or not. That is a, a, an MGL. Um, this, you have to understand how the current bylaw is written. Today, it allows the developer to choose to either circumvent this by building fewer than 10 homes or to build an affordable house somewhere else in Hopkinton that they figure out where they put it or to just write a check to the Affordable Housing Authority. And that is why this is important, because it puts the power back in the town to say, no, you're going to build an affordable home in the land that you're developing. You can't just simply write a check to make it go away. This is a critical to allow us to have more control over the process. Moderator, uh, Stacy Spies, 16 Alexander. I'd like to make a uh, motion to move the vote. Okay. Just so one second. All in favor of moving, and again, that is just to getting to vote. All in favor. All opposed. Seeing there are none, we'll go to the vote. We need two thirds majority for Article 25. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? No. Okay, for, for this one, we are going to do a standing count. Please stand if you're an I and hold your... Folks in the front may sit down. I'm sorry, my front.
Center Middle, 65. Thank you. Stage right, 71. Center back, 54. Thank you. Outside, four. Left, 82. Okay, thank you. All right. Everybody who just voted, you may be seated. Now the um, nays, please stand and, and hold your uh, ticket up. Left two. Outside zero. Thank you. Center middle five. Stage right one. Center back one. Okay, Article 25 passes. It needed a two-thirds majority, and we have 287 to nine. Two-thirds majority. Yeah, I hear a motion to adjourn from someone. All in favor? Okay, we will see you tomorrow, Article 26, electric vehicles. Okay, we'll be here tomorrow night at 7 p.m., night two. Thank you.